Hello, TSLP listener. This is Dustin with a brief message to let you know that this episode was massive. Um, it was over three hours long, and we felt like that was really long for a single podcast episode. So we split it into two parts. Um, part one, we're going to be talking mostly about the movie The Shining. And then part two, we'll talk mostly about Room 237, the sequel Dr. Sleep, the miniseries, all that sort of uh, related materials that aren't exactly the movie itself. That will drop uh, later this week. So just want to give you a heads up. This is not technically a full episode, so you'll get the second part a little later on. But um, yeah, uh, hope you enjoy it. I am Dustin Goes to Hollywood. And I'm JT Kelly. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, or I should say, a Spooky Linings Playlist, the podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's scariest endings. This is it. This is the season four finale, episode 104 of the Silver Linings Playlist. This is our last one before we go on hiatus for the year. Uh, and this is monumental. This is an episode I've been wanting to do forever. Uh, this is a powerhouse of a movie and it's going to be just as much of an episode. Um, but a little bit of business up, up, uh, up front, you just heard not Mally Moore introduce himself. You heard, in fact, previous guest JT Kelly, who's joining me this week. Um, Mally, unfortunately could not be available, uh, for this episode. He died. <laughs> um, so <laughs> now Mally is, uh, Mally actually has a good problem to have. He is working a lot, which is great considering, you know, he's in the film industry, and of course, the film industry got hit pretty hard with COVID. Oh, my gosh, um, yeah. But, Good for Mally. But, uh, he, yeah, yeah. He wasn't available, unfortunately, to tear himself away from his work to join us on this episode. So, JT, thank you for filling in as a last-minute replacement. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you gave me a lot of homework for two days. Yeah. An absolute <laughs> for For those who don't know, this whole season – we were really good about being ahead of schedule in terms of recording. Like we had episodes banked, ready to go, so we wouldn't have any issues. Uh, and then, of course, on the finale, we're recording this only like two days before it comes out. So this is it's it's crazy how this schedule turned out. But we're here. We're finally doing it. Uh, I couldn't have picked a better co-host. I mean, you're one of my favorite people in the world. This is one of my favorite movies. Uh, yes. So okay, yeah. So this, yeah, I was about to ask that if. This is or close to your favorite horror movie or one of the top favorites. I've known that about so, you. And when you gave me this homework, I'm like stressing. I was like, I've been a <laughs> footnote on this podcast and you're giving me this slot on this movie. Uh, mm -hmm. I kind of went overboard with the notes. Oh, I did too. I, I had no <laughs> idea how often y'all use or how, how many notes you guys have. I have about four or five pages. Because I needed filler. I needed... Um, <laughs> I wanted to bring I'm some like ammo, a, yeah. Normally, I'm like a one to two page guy. I don't want to say how many I have for this one because I don't want to scare the listener. But let's just say it's going to be a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, to answer your question, though, this is probably my favorite movie. Like, full stop. Like, I feel like anybody that knows me knows how much I love this movie. Um, it's And it's weird because... You know, one of the first things we like to do is we like to talk about what our relationship is with this movie. I can't tell you the first time I saw it. I feel I like I was about to flip the script on you and say, well, Dustin, on this podcast, we usually like to talk about our relationship with this movie. Uh, but I've never <laughs> thought about it. I never thought about asking that ever. OK, I know it's your favorite movie, but mm -hmm. what this was is it so like strange. I got to say, first of all, Mally never asked questions to me. <laughs> he never yeah. asked. Well, see, I feel so like, like I need to wow. because this is your movie. <laughs> You know, I like The Shining just as much as the next guy, but I mean, this is your thing. So during the rewatch, uh, I was like, I got to ask about this, this, and this. Uh, 
but you can't remember the first time you seen this movie? No, it's it's a. I, I was I tell Mally this all the time whenever we're talking about movies on the show. From like age sixteen to like nineteen, I was on a huge tear to just watch every movie I could, and this was one of those movies when I was really starting to get into Kubrick. Um, but I can't recall the first time. It's it's so crazy. I've seen this movie countless times, and I even had the pleasure of seeing it last year on the big screen for the first time in a, a 4K restoration right before Doctor Sleep came out, and it was amazing. I'm this glad movie that's looked so good. Up. Like I'm glad something like that's starting to like take hold is uh, showing older movies mm-hmm. in theaters, mm-hmm. especially right now where a lot of a lot of movies aren't coming out. Either they've been delayed yeah. or stuff like that. Uh, I think recently here in Little Dothan, you, I think the Goonies was playing in theaters. That's pretty and, cool. And, you know, yeah, just no drive-in the, theaters and stuff too. Yeah, like have really made a killing off these local drive-ups. Yeah, and stuff. actually, ours, uh, our local drive drive-in theater closed, and then someone saw a gold mine and opened it back up, and it's back up playing <laughs> movies now. I don't know why drive-in movie theaters like completely fell off like that. I mean, it is such a niche thing, but. Like, it's also easy to do. Like, it's a, it's an easy thing. You get the comfort of being in your own car. I mean, I get also the benefits of being in a theater. But, like, some movies just really lend themselves to, I would say, a drive-in experience. Like, especially a lot of kids' movies and stuff, you know? Yes. Like, kids older kids' movies, movies would like, be great. Especially, like, double feature things. Like, I would – yes. that's a, Or, for like, kids, the cheesy yes. 80s horror movies, too. Like, the old Friday the 13th and stuff would be great for a drive-in theater. Yeah, it would. Like, super now, spooky. the one thing – the only problem I have with drive-in, uh, drive-in theaters is the audio. I mean, your audio is only as good as your car radio. So, yeah. and you only get, you're not getting true like 7.1 or 5.1 even really. Yeah. Your car, you're getting stereo. So, but you're right. Just for a campy, like, like movies that are old movies that you've already seen. That's, mm-hmm. you want to have that experience. See them on the big screen. It seems really fun. Yeah, I'm glad not, people are doing it. It's not ideal for, I'd say, new new movies you haven't seen before. But if you've seen it, it's a, you know, you're familiar with it. Definitely a drive-in would be great. Um, well, JT, since, um, you know, we had you on the show recently with Halloween. It only makes sense to have you back for The Shining because it's such a crazy distance between those two movies and even, you know, all the other horror movies we've done on the show. We don't really cover a lot of prestige horror movies. So this is an interesting one to do, especially for our finale. What was your relationship with this movie? When was the first time you saw it? How did it hold up on this rewatch? Um, and, you know... What this movie has a lot going for it that's not just the movie. Like there's, you know, room two thirty seven. There's all oh, the conspiracy God. theories. Yes. Like, what's your whole history with The Shining? I have my dear mother to thank for this movie. Me and her, we were. Uh, I was had to have been uh, eight, nine around there. Uh, I was completely turned off from scary movies. <laughs> yeah. Too young. I was completely turned off from scary movies because I watched Halloween and Halloween, it literally gave me night terrors and it stressed me out. So I didn't watch scary movies. I walk in, my mom is a super Stephen King fan, Dean Koontz. Like she, she's a reader. She reads, she likes the adaptations, but I don't know. Yeah. This movie. Mally's mom had this, had a similar thing. Like she really loved the horror Stephen King. And I, th- I think he even told me the miniseries, the shining miniseries was like huge in his house. So this movie was, I had mom to hated also it. a part of that. Mom hated it. Actually. Yeah, dude. I, like you'd, you'd be proud of this moment. I actually called her today to be like, Hey, uh, I forgot to tell you this, but I'm going to be on a podcast with us today. We're talking about the shining. And she's like, Oh really? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And, uh, we were talking about, <clears throat> We we're talking about Jack Nicholson. And she's like, yeah, that other guy that played in that other remake or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. I just didn't like that one. I yeah. was like, what do you mean? She's like, it was just awful. Like, it's and real I was bad. Like, yes. But even like, I was going <laughs> over stuff like, uh, well, she's like, well, what are you taking notes about it for? Like, don't you just talk about it? And I kind of gave her a couple notes that I had. And she's like, oh, yeah. And another thing, like, uh, the, with mirrors and stuff. And I'll get into that in a moment. But mm-hmm. and I was like, all right, mom. Like, you want to hop on? Like, what are you doing later? <laughs> I would love to have Mama Kelly on the podcast. Yeah. That'd be great. My mom sat me down and make let me watch this with her because she said there's no, like, there's it's not like a serial killer. It's not a slasher. It's just kind of spooky and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. so it was scary in the sense of, yeah, I was terrified of it. But it was scary in the sense of I'm looking at something and I'm terrified versus uh, it just jumping out like a mm-hmm. lot of slashers are. Mm-hmm. 
And I thoroughly had a good time with it. Me and mom talked about it afterwards. It's just been something we've watched plenty of times before. On this rewatch, uh, I think since the last time I watched it, thanks to you guys getting me into movies, uh, way back in the day, I guess I noticed a lot more things than I normally wouldn't as a casual viewer. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to get in a lot of that as far as... uh, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, a lot of the stuff that if you blink, you miss it. Or if you didn't have that trained eye, you wouldn't notice it. Um, yeah, but absolutely. And of course it's the shining. Uh, of course it hold it held up. It absolutely, right. I had to break it up for work reasons and split it up. But some things I didn't realize what was going on from back then that I know what's going on now. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was definitely worth a rewatch. So I want to go back to something you mentioned because uh, I had an, a, simil- a similar experience. Would you say um, Halloween is probably your favorite horror franchise, um, right? Mm, see. <laughs> I know you're a huge Michael Myers fan. Yes, I'm a huge Michael Myers fan. Uh, I'm going to have to say yes uh, because it holds a special place. Or is it the best and the most consistent franchise? Right. No, um, unfortunately. But you said you saw that at like a young age and like in later in your life, it became like the thing that you attracted yourself to. I had a similar experience with the first horror movie I saw at way too young an age. I think I was like eight or nine like you. I saw the original Dawn of the Dead, um, 1978, Ooh. I believe. Um, yeah. And I was way too young to be seeing it. And I was with my brother who's four years older than me and his friends. And I had to play like I wasn't scared, but at the first zombie bite in that apartment building that's being sworn by the police at the beginning, I uh-huh. you know you see him bite his wife and the the flesh tearing out of her neck, and it's like orange blood, and yeah, I, uh, I it was so uh, horrifying. Old, uh, old Tom Savini, right? Tom Savini doing the makeup, I believe, on that one too. Yeah, I think he, um, play, he played in it too, right? Like he plays the, the biker, biker dude. Yeah, he's yeah. the leader of the biker gang. Um, but no, that movie now is like one of my it's easily top five favorite horror movies and maybe even like my top 10 of all time movies that like dawn of the dead the original is so fucking amazing and it's weird that like you latch onto those things that you were so horrified once yes as a kid okay, like, so like uh to me you know like we're gonna throw out the big heavy hitters you know jason and freddy mm-hmm. yeah they're scary but freddy's like supernatural i was never scared of supernatural and yeah. never got me jason me, me too Jason in the first two movies, like his mom and him, yeah, that's scary. But when he starts like regenerating body parts, I'm like, okay, you're not scary anymore. Yeah, uh, Leatherface is pretty terrifying. I think Leatherface is, yeah, I like, I, I never, I missed the whole Friday the Thirteenth and Nightmare on Elm Street train. I didn't see those until I was older, and it had no real effect on me. Leatherface, you know, is, I think, just something inherently terrifying about so, a chainsaw so in let general. Me put it in perspective, I think, uh, like, okay. Michael Myers being the most realistic, right? Like he escaped mm-hmm. lunatic, he silently stalks and it kills people. Like, yeah, most realistic. And realistic is scary. Realistic scared me. Uh, in terms, he's just a man. In a one on one, you could fist fight him and win, or you could, you can obviously outrun him. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Now, so there's a sense of. A survivability, I can get away from this. Yeah. Personally, not just anybody, but personally, I can get away from them. Mm-hmm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> if I was like, I don't know yeah. what you call it, the house, the woods around the house, his entire family, I know I'm not going to survive. Like, I don't no, know. Especially, like, I know a lot of people don't like it, but I really liked that uh, 2003 remake. 2003, yes. I was, I'm glad it's you said so that. Good. Like that. There's the, so the guy many playing Leatherface more... there is sprinting yeah. with a chainsaw. It's horrifying. Yes. I mean, uh-huh. he he's sprinting in the original, too, but, like, I don't know. that. Yeah, Leatherface always got, got me. Like, uh, the the Romero of the Dead's got me. Um, but bringing it back to The Shining, like you mentioned, the realism. Like, this movie is filled with the supernatural, but essentially you boil it down to it's man versus man, essentially man versus woman. Um, right. I kind of, and it's um, just, it's just look, a guy I, with an axe. I, I kind of had a uh, census as I was getting all this together. Cause I, you know, we're going to talk about room 237 later, but mm-hmm. each of these individual people talking about it, they talked about what they think it was about, whether it be yeah. a Indian genocide or the Holocaust. It, and again, this is a very, uh, ground level. What I was 
get the vibes I were get, I was getting, I guess. Mm-hmm. Especially when he was locked in the pantry and stuff. It seemed like a a uh, his macho was being tested. And let me explain. So the American gene, you know, got the husband that works hard to provide for his family. You got the wife that stays at home, takes care of the kids, stuff like that. It's that, but in the absolute worst way possible. The worst. Mm-hmm. Of, it's like the it's, American It's the destruction nightmare. of the nuclear family. Like yes. it's okay. It's not uh, the the rosy, the rose colored glasses looking back in the fifties of man goes to work, woman provides like we're, we're done with that. And what I kind of got from it was he was teaching. He got this new job, better opportunity. So he feels like it's something that he, you know, he's worked hard for and he's here mm-hmm. now and it's his responsibility. That's his duty, I guess. Yeah. And then like, for example, the first time Wendy came in and interrupted him from writing and stuff and he went ape shit. He, mm-hmm. he finally got back to writing from a writer's block and she ruined it. He got upset. Yeah. Okay. And then later on in the pantry, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, <laughs> I guess he's getting made fun of pretty much getting called a coward saying like, we don't think you have the stomach to kill your family. Yeah. Like, and all this stuff. And he's being challenged and he's like, as soon as I get out of here, I'll, he doesn't even realize <laughs> what he needs to prove. He doesn't realize that he's trying to prove himself by killing his family. He's just trying to prove himself. Yeah. Yeah. No, this movie, it's, this is the reason I love Kubrick. This movie can be interpreted in so many different ways depending on how you're feeling at any given time. Like it's, it could be a tale of uh, toxic masculinity. It could be a tale of isolationism and what that does to the the primal senses in a person. It could be, like you said, it could be a tale about writer's block. It's a, it can be a tale of anything you need it to be, and you can fit that mold. I think that's what separates most directors from you know just the run of the mill blockbusters is they have a way of making things fit to not just one allegory like it it's weird because you know i watch this movie and depending on my mood it changes how i see the movie like if i'm in a good mood i'll sit down and watch this movie and i can laugh at it like this movie can be unintentionally hilarious at times and even seeing it in the theater when i saw it in the theater the crowd and that i was with we had a great time Laughing at parts that maybe we shouldn't be laughing at, but it's 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 all dependent on how you're feeling in that moment. Because if I'm also in a bad mood, I can look at this movie and be terrified. Yeah, like yeah, even you can knowing what's coming down around and corner. depressed and just yeah. yeah. And I I was because <laughs> funny you say that I had to split this up between two different nights. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was after a ten hour shift, and then one of them was this morning on my day off. Mm-hmm. Two different feelings. Like I just like. Yeah. Working 10 hours, I sit down, I'm so tired. I got to start this. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, you're exactly right. But which, that's what, again, we're going to talk about Kubrick uh, Kubrick, and that's how it makes him genius. Kubrick's known for like, oh, well, that was a, just a accident. No, that he did everything on, he's, there's pictures of him placing products like in the background, like moving them for a reason. Okay. Which also, it also makes you want to think like, Yo, how many of that was actually planned and how much – he's like, hey, let's just throw all this shit at the wall and see what sticks. Well, th- that's the one thing that I just I, – I, it's unfortunate about not just this movie but Kubrick as his whole filmography and his, his uh, legacy as a director is he's not around anymore to you know clear things up. So it's really frustrating like – I, I rewatched Room 237 in preparation for this episode, and that documentary is a pile of dog shit. Like, nine per, nine out of ten things that they're, you know, spouting in that documentary is full, utter bullshit. Um, it does have a few things that, like, you know, it makes you, like, yeah. raise your eyebrows. Or There was some cool things in there, but, like, I started watching it. Like, I got halfway through and I had to start getting ready. Uh, I had to stop it because this guy, like... It, like I know it was, it's not like a actual like production documentary, mm-hmm. but this guy, the way he's talking is just like, uh, yeah. And then he was talking oh, about there's the, one moment I want to get to. I think I know which guy you're talking about. It's the guy um, that he pretty much had. He's like, "Do you hear my kid in the background? Hold on one second. Oh, <laughs> he had a good. Yeah, not that leave. guy. Not that guy. But there's another guy in that one that is I, his, his voice is nails on a chalkboard to me. Um, but there's one thing. That I want to point out in that documentary, which we'll get there when we get to it. But um, yeah, that that documentary is a pile of garbage, and it's unfortunate because, like I said, Kubrick's not here to really explain himself, and he doesn't need to. 
But I think some of the thing people latch onto with this movie is for all the wrong reasons. Like this movie is not Kubrick confessing to faking the moon landing. It's just not. Um, <laughs> maybe it it is a tale of uh, Native American genocide. I can definitely get behind that. I can also get behind uh, the Holocaust theory because Kubrick was, you know, he was known for wanting to create this Holocaust movie, but never getting uh, getting around to it. So I can definitely see that being applied. But for the most part, a lot of conspiracy theories around this movie are just utter bullshit. And it's, it sucks because you have to weed out the garbage to get to anything that's even remotely like worth talking about. But we're already like 20 minutes in. We got, we got a lot to cover on the show. So I want to back up for a little bit. If this is your first time, uh, tuning into the Silver Linings playlist. First of all, welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, what we like to do on the show here is we watch movies that don't end in a happily ever after, that don't end with a nice little bow and ribbon on the end of things. Thing uh, endings that you know are either uh, depressing or um, leave your leave you scratching your head. Uh, endings that when you walk away, you're just not feeling all that great. They just bring you down a little bit, and we try to bring you back up. Uh, by pointing out something good that happened at the end, hence the silver lining that we find there. Um, this movie, you know, uh, it's the ending is great. I'll go ahead and say the ending is great. Different from the book, different from the Shining miniseries, which we'll talk about. Um, but in order to do this movie proper, that we we have to talk not just about the movie itself, but you have to talk about everything because there's so much here to get into. Yeah. That, isn't just what's on screen. There's so much to get into. Um, so with that, why don't we talk about uh, some of the details surrounding the production and the release of The Shining? Okay, I got a couple things on that. Uh, okay. The Just a couple fun facts, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Oh, okay. Um, you did your so, homework. I don't, should I even talk about parts? Okay, so Snow. All right, so at the end... Uh, during the end scene, of course, we'll get to that. I'm, not, I'm trying to do these facts without any spoiler, anything like that. But during okay. the snow scene at the end in the hedge maze, um, Mother Nature decided not to give him enough snow. Right? So. Yeah. And uh, I just found this out, actually, <laughs> while researching it for this episode. Yeah. Uh, they decided to put filler with, let's see, 900 tons of salt and shredded yeah. styrofoam. Yeah, a lot of that snow is not snow in this movie. It's mostly yeah. salt and styrofoam, which is crazy because it looks so good on screen. Yeah, it really did. It, especially like falling snow. When the falling snow mm -hmm. was coming down, the fact that that's salt and styrofoam, mm -hmm. absolutely great. All right. So everybody has seen the elevator shot. Okay. That's not a spoiler. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. So Kubrick lied <laughs> yep. to the MPAA mm -hmm. that he was not using real blood. Mm -hmm. In fact, he did, but then when they reviewed it, they're like, I thought you didn't use real blood. And he said it wasn't. It was uh, rusty water. It's rusty water. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, By the what? way, I just want to point out, I as you know, this is like watching your, your kid blossom from like a little toddler to a full grown adult. I love watching you read these things that I, that I know. And I'm glad the audience is learning this too, that, that maybe they don't know, but I'm just so proud. Oh, to yeah. see someone <laughs> yeah. do this much research Yo, for my favorite movie. <laughs> yeah, and it's look because I like you, like I said, I knew this was going to be a special episode. Mm -hmm. I have been on a total of one podcast, and <laughs> I wanted to bring everything, man. No holds bars. We're doing it. Did you know there's an alternate ending, Dustin? I did know about the alternate ending. Son we of a we bitch. can talk about that. We can talk about that when we get to the movie. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I just want to talk, talk about. about um, yeah, no, I just I just want to talk about like if people aren't too familiar with this movie, which you know how could you be, not be at this point? But if you are someone who's never seen The Shining, um, all you have to know is the year is 1980. The director, as we mentioned, was Stanley Kubrick. The film stars Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, Scatman Crothers, and Danny Lloyd. Uh, the budget was 19 million dollars, and it managed to gross 46 and a half million, so a hit. Highest grossing, uh, one of the highest grossings of that year. Mm -hmm. Of that decade, actually. Uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, it, and right at the beginning, too, came out in 1980. Like, right yeah. in... It's technically like a 70s movie, because it was filmed... It took a year to film this movie, which is unheard of. Like, it's so long for a movie to film. And see, that's um, the things that you know that I don't, that... Yeah, principal photography took a year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Currently, it sits at 84% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is, it has to be in the 90s. This movie deserves to be in the okay, 90s. But also, when the movie first came out, it... Critically panned, cri- for the yeah, most part. critically panned. So, those critics probably just bred, and that's why it's only 84. <laughs> yeah. Um, it currently sits at number 62 on IMDb's top 250 movies of all time. And this is ups- this is so upsetting. I didn't know about this until I was researching for this episode. This movie was nominated for two Razzies Worst in actress. the first in the first year of the Razzies. <laughs> uh, Shelley Duvall for worst actor and Kubrick for worst director. Which I I can't even, I can't put my head in the the headspace of seeing this movie for the first time in 1980 and not thinking that it's you know brilliantly directed and brilliantly acted like Shelley Duvall is out fucking standing in this movie like she gets better every time i see her in this movie i know there's a lot of criticism with that she's just playing the quote-unquote dumb woman that's just there for like yeah okay like, but the slaughter does that make her a bad she's, actor that she plays no a good, dumb she's woman? doing she's doing so much like yeah nicholson is doing great work but i feel like he's got the easy part she is the heart of this movie her and danny are the heart of this movie and you know, Danny's a child actor. He can only do so much. But even with that, Danny Lloyd is also amazing in this movie. Uh, Shelley Duvall is fucking bringing it. It's yeah, and uh, I mean, it's it's a pretty popular fact that she was completely abused during the filming of this by Stanley Kubrick. Yes. Okay, so people um, say abuse. Other people say she was pushed. You know, getting the best she could. So. I'm gl- I'm glad we're talking about this now. We can get we can get this kind of out of the way. Yes, I will say this was not a an easy production by any means. Like this was hard hard work. But there is some fabrication surrounding that, like the the idea that Kubrick shot that scene of him and her going up the stairs and everything when during like a uh, where Jack's got the base well she's got the baseball bat yeah. did not take 127 takes or whatever they say it was i no, the first ad and the the camera operator have denied that it does take a lot i mean i'm not saying that he didn't do probably like 30 takes of that but it's also a really hard scene to shoot like they go around that entire room like it's a it's of course it's, it's gonna take a, a lot of takes. long shot showing a lot of emotion uh, a lot of movement a lot of lines lot of movement. to be delivered uh yeah it's it's a lot and uh gosh what was i about to say uh no, I uh, watched a few things about the whole how many times it took. Um, Kubrick, uh, it doesn't matter what shots he's doing, what scene he's in. Uh, mm-hmm. Even if the actors to get it right like the fifth time, he's going to do 60 takes just to see what yeah. happens. Uh, Scatman Crothers, you know, he's a musician. He's on yeah. that, And then the ice cream scene, uh, Scatman is finally just like, I can't do this shit anymore. Like you got to yeah. take or not? Like what's up? He got he was getting frustrated. Meanwhile, Danny just gives you a shit ton of ice cream, so they're like, "Well, he's not being abused. <laughs> he's good." Uh, yeah. But yeah, Scatman had a huge problem. Well, here's the thing too: like Kubrick unfairly, I think, gets this uh, you know reputation of being a perfectionist to the point of being a nihilist almost, or like being abusive to his to his cast and crew. But he's not. First of all, he's not the the first and only director to do this. I mean, Michael Bay does this. David Fincher does this. Hitchcock did this. But the difference is it, sometimes you have to do those things. You have to push your – I'm not saying you have to abuse them. You don't have to, you know, take a movie and turn it into a torture fest. But, like, look at the performance we get out of Janet Lee in Psycho. Look at the performance we get out of uh, – Oh, fuck, I can't remember her name now, but the woman from The Birds. Look at the performance we get out of Shelley Duvall in this movie. Like, it breeds amazing results, things that stand the test of time. And, you know, Hitchcock was famous for saying, uh, I don't think my actors are cattle, but I treat them like cattle. And, when you know, what I always interpret that to mean is actors are a tool. Yes, they're human beings, and no movie sh- is above, like – you know, death or, or abuse, physical, emotional, verbal, whatever it is. However, the director's job is to get the best performance and to get the tone that he needs for that scene, for that movie to work. And yeah. while he does cross a line with Shelley Duvall, like you can see it in the uh, documentary that his daughter Vivian Kubrick shot, he does cross a line. 
there's also something I did not know about, and I don't know how much credit there is to this uh, rumor, but you know, I, from what I can see in the documentary and what I can read about from the crew behind the scenes, um, one of the you know I don't want to say excuses, but one of the reasons a lot of people point to Kubrick having such animosity towards Shelley Duvall was that she was um, abusing drugs on set, like doing a lot of cocaine. Um, there's even one specific moment in the Vivian Kubrick documentary, which we'll get to um, at the end, but it's when Shelley Duvall is showing that her hair is falling out and like showing it to, I think who uh, maybe the art director or something, just showing like strains of hair coming out from her stress. And Kubrick offhandedly makes a comment of don't, says to somebody like don't pity her or something like that and you can see Shelley Duvall kind of wipe her nose like you know as you would after doing a line of coke right which again I don't I can't give this theory credit because I don't know the facts I wasn't there I can only yeah, say what I've seen but I didn't I didn't know about this until recently and I've you know read up on it and some cast was, and crew it was say it was true time. but I feel like the yeah, late 70s, the late 70s when shit. they're filming this so everybody's doing cocaine Again, not, that not wasn't to say only, that wasn't only just nine hundred tons of salt and shredded. <laughs> yeah, it's not just styrofoam. not just uh, salt and styrofoam out there. But again, it's it's unfortunate too that Shelley Duvall has also deteriorated like so rapidly recently. Uh, I you know I couldn't find the full interview, but I saw clips of her at her Doctor Phil interview, and it's disgusting what he did. Like to to put her on a, a stage like that and show the whole world, but to say that this is like the result of Kubrick, you know, abusing her in the eighties, I I don't buy that at all. Like it's she's an older woman. Like it's unfortunate that things happen like that, but her she still had an acting career after that. You know, she was in Popeye and a bunch of other stuff, and I don't think her experience on this movie led. I mean, then again. I don't know. I wasn't there. Who's to say? Yeah, we, um, we're not defending or uh, we're attacking anybody. This just is looking at it all from all different angles. Yeah, it's all. I just want to get the full story out there. I would love to know, you know, from firsthand experiences more. But this is what I'm going off of, and like I said, not defending it. But again, the the performance Shelley Duvall gives in this movie is is amazing. It's it's bar none one of the best performances I've ever seen. Uh, going to uh, it, it, we're all familiar with Jack Nicholson's career. I felt like we mm-hmm. don't touch too much on that. But uh, Danny, what's his name again? Danny Lloyd. That's the actor's name. Yes, and also oh. you know playing Danny in the movie. Oh, cool, convenient. Uh, mm-hmm. He uh, he had a very small TV role after The Shining, mm-hmm. uh, and then after that he just uh, he's I read up somewhere where. He was he getting pops older. He up in Doctor school. Sleep as a cameo, but yeah, yeah he doesn't uh, do much acting after this. Yeah, and basically, he is a school teacher and a pig farmer now. But the fun mm-hmm. fact about it is, uh, he was five when the movie was filmed. Mm-hmm. He didn't even see the movie until he was sixteen. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, mm-hmm. he didn't even know he was in a horror movie that whole time. Yeah, I think he said he was in a romantic comedy or something like that. They thought he was in. Yeah, yeah. Cooper what, got a what, real good way with working with kids, man. Yeah, so it so okay, so that goes back to the whole menace or you know good guy. Like okay, he's yeah abusing her, but treating this kid again. We can't well, go there. He's great with Danny behind the scenes. Like when he's directing Danny, it's amazing because you know Danny Lloyd's giving an interview to Vivian like uh, in that documentary, and he's he is just as happy as can be, and he's. It's amazing how quickly he switches from being like the happy little five year old, like laughing and giggling and doing that thing that kids do where they just have run on sentences that make right. no sense. But then when he gets on set and he's in front of the camera, like he's doing so fucking much as a kid, like and to yeah. not know he's in a horror movie yeah. is yeah, wild. That to be hidden from okay, so and I thought about that and I read that fact after I watched the movie. And I was like, there's scenes where you're doing this weird thing with your voice and just screaming red rum. There's yep. scenes where you're looking at the camera completely terrified, like mm-hmm. that terrified look. And you thought you were in a comedy. Yeah. My man, yeah. like <laughs> he's, he's active on Twitter too. And I've, I've, you know, messaged him back and forth a few times. He's so polite and so grateful. And that's awesome. Really love Dr. Sleep. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of his fam- uh, Kubrick's family on, on, Twitter and stuff as well that are active. Yeah, so it's going, okay. That segue into Kubrick's family. Uh, brother-in-law uh, mm-hmm. was executive producer on The Shining. Mm-hmm. Uh, the movie that was made right before The Shining, 
that he did. Uh, Barry Lyndon, I think, is yes, right before yes. this. Yes, it was yeah. a really boring movie. It did awful. And it, it basically the way I was, again, I was reading the article thing. It was, seemed like a genius director was bored, so he made a boring movie. Mm-hmm. And when I he mean, got, Hitchcock did the same with Psycho. Like, he he had done his big movie and went back to, like, the small roots. Like, let me make a horror movie or something low yeah. budget, you know. And yeah. then, uh, yeah, and then The Shining, like, and again, right away, critics didn't take too well of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that's what The Shining is all about. Like, it, first view, you, like, it's going to make you watch it. Like, he wants you to watch it multiple times. It's like, mm-hmm. you walk out like, I don't get that movie I don't like it. Why don't I like it? I don't know. Let me go watch it again. And then by mm-hmm. the time you realize, like, wow, I like the movie. Um, but <laughs> continue going. Uh, his daughter and wife, I think, mm-hmm. was the uh, set designers. And well, Vivian, I know, was – I don't know if she had a part of the crew of this movie, but she did – you know, she was on set filming the – Behind the scenes, in terms of his wife, I wasn't familiar with that—that that she had any involvement with the movie. But I, I, know it's I his would... daughter and somebody mm-hmm. uh, was set design and wardrobe or something like that. Basically, he had his it, family involved with it, which I thought was really cool. Speaking of Vivian, um, the, her documentary is great. She is a full right wing nut job on Twitter, and it's so sad. But then also. Kubrick's, I believe his stepdaughter, uh, Catherine Kubrick, is also on Twitter and is the exact opposite. <laughs> and it's oh, interesting great. to see them too. Yeah, like I don't even think they they speak, but like I followed both of them, and I bet it's they don't even to follow each other. <laughs> Probably not. Um, all right, well, we've already done a lot of talking about this movie, and you know, I was gonna play a trailer from the movie for the 4K restoration, but since it's not the original trailer, which was just the opening of the the elevator. Like that was the teaser trailer for the movie. It's just the opening of the elevator with like a text scroll. Yeah, it's not I, I love playing. It. So, um, here's what I want to do. This is gonna. We're already 30 minutes into this episode, and we haven't even really started talking about the movie. Um, I want to split this into a couple parts. I want to talk about the movie itself, like just the plot. I want to talk about the movie's legacy, um, and then a little bit about Kubrick himself, which we've kind of already done. Um, and then that's going to wrap up our discussion on The Shining. And then after that, I want to get into all the associated stuff. I want to get into Room 237. I want to get into that documentary a little bit more, Dr. Sleep, the miniseries, Great. all now, that. keep in mind uh, – okay, so the miniseries – look, I watched it when I was a kid. We don't need to watch that again. Uh, yeah. Dr. Sleep. I had never not- seen it until just a few days ago. God. I mean, well, I mean, yeah. even as a kid, I was like, this kid's haircut's fucking stupid. Oh, <laughs> that bowl cut. Woof. Yo. Jesus. Whoa. Anyways, but I have not seen Doctor Sleep yet. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, so uh, I won't trivial, give you any spoilers, trivially. but we'll talk in generalities about it. Yes, um, because that's I have questions. I'm like, how does The Shining work? That was my kind of like spoil. Like, we'll give a little tease. Doctor Sleep is amazing. I'll go oh, ahead so and tell you. You did like I've, like once I, I loved knew- the movie. Love okay. the movie. I haven't read the book, but I've heard the book is dog shit. So <laughs> take that what you will. <laughs> right. Um, right, so okay. how, do you want to, how do you want to crack this open? Well, let's talk a little bit about Kubrick first. Um, so what do you think about this idea? I mean, we kind of briefly just talked about this with Hitchcock, but there's this idea of once a director kind of achieves greatness, like Kubrick kind of had it early on with 2001. Right. Um, and then, he, you know, he's got Lolita. He's got Barry Lyndon. He's got Spartacus. Like he's he's a household name. And he's like you said, Barry Lyndon comes out and it it seems like somebody who's bored. Hitchcock did the same, you know. He had uh, Vertigo, North by Northwest, uh, and then he that? does Psycho. Yeah, and and both. It's uh, we just saw this recently with Tarantino. Like Tarantino did this big movie, Hateful Eight, very ambitious, but also like a kind of tired trope, like we're used to seeing. And then he goes and does this much quieter movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like I, f- I, I don't know what this is about directors that once they've hit the crowning achievement in their eyes that they they go back to their roots and they do these little movies, which I love because they're all like my favorites. You know, like Psycho is one of my favorite Hitchcock movies and The Shining is one of my favorite Kubrick movies. It's Maybe it's, it's an weird... unpopular opinion, but I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. It It's – every time I watch it, it gets better. It, every look, time I watch it, it gets better. I think it's because they uh, – once they get that hype, you know what I mean? They get that – 
Yeah. Oh, it, like, oh, it's a Quentin Tarantino movie. You'll love it. You know, like, it has that niche. Uh, I guess once you get that, you go in expecting a Quentin yeah. Tarantino movie or something like that. And if you, yeah. and if the director doesn't deliver on that, then of course people are going to get upset or something. You know what I mean? Uh, but as far as why they hit their big thing and then going back down, maybe it's just, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but it it's, seems it's, like that's it's, a thing that happens. Yeah, it's a weird, it's an interesting thing. I mean, a uh, past guest on the show, uh, Dylan Merriman, told me about, about this idea that every third movie a director puts out um, is kind of the quieter one. Like with Tarantino, he did Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs. Well, let me rephrase that. Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, and then he does Jackie Brown. And Jackie Brown seems like a movie he should be doing nowadays in his older age and he's more yeah. refined and everything. Okay, yeah. And then he did the same thing with like uh, – you know, uh, Django Unchained, Hateful Eight, and then Once Upon a Time. Like they all, they seem to do this in patterns, and it's interesting. Um, I don't, I don't know why either. I, I love the idea though that like, okay, I can do anything I want, but let me go back and say, do maybe this it's little thing. Once, okay, so let's go off Dylan's theory. Mm-hmm. You make one great movie. Ah, right, dude, that was great. Let's keep the ball rolling. We're gonna give you this one. Okay, and then it's absolutely phenomenal. Dude, you killed it. Look, we're going to give you free reigns. Do whatever you want to. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it might be, I feel like it Fincher might be the did third this one. Too. Might be something that they wanted to do. Huh? Yeah. I feel like Fincher did this. I want to say I might be missing one, but isn't it like Panic Room, um, The Game, and then, fuck, Curious Case of Benjamin Button? No, there's got to be something else in there. I don't know. Anyway. I just thought it was an interesting idea. Like The Shining is like a much lower budget, much smaller thing, and it's interesting too because I I read a, uh, a interview where Stephen King, who you know has had a contemptuous uh, relationship with this movie, that ha- he's since come around on it. But yeah. of course, when it came out, he hated it. He despised Kubrick for what he did, and he was doing this interview. I can't remember with who, but he said that the way this movie came about for Kubrick was. Kubrick told his his staff to like bring him just stacks and stacks of horror books, and he was going to read them in his office. And Kubrick's secretary uh, would would like hear this thud sound every few like minutes or hours. And apparently, it was Kubrick just reading the first like couple pages of a book and just tossing it to the wall into the trash. Jesus! And after like after a while, she didn't hear the thuds anymore, and she went back in and saw that he was reading The Shining, and that's how he decided to make that movie. So That's like, sick. yeah, it's it's uh, you know it's interesting too that he's like I done Barry Lyndon, uh, I want to do horror because I haven't really done horror. Bring me all the books and then just thud 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 thud. <laughs> oh, I found gold, <laughs> you know. And I I as someone who hasn't read the book, I do know there are a lot of differences from the book that the the miniseries tries to make up for, but ultimately it's just you know maybe it's just that miniseries, but it just doesn't work as well. Yeah, like the whole. Uh- the hedge animals and stuff like that. Yeah, look that was, horrible. That was even, the CG like, looks was, horrible. Yeah, that was even on the cover of the original Shining book. I, I think it works if you have the hedge maze that's in this movie, and then you put the hedge maze animals in it. But just to have them out walking around in the snow, it looks ridiculous. Uh, like it looks I so mean, bad in that miniseries. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but this is. I mean, you say not to judge a book by its cover, but that's exactly what a covers for <laughs> that yeah. is a michael che joke i don't want to copyright that but yeah if he looked at that book cover <laughs> and if he was looking at all the book covers and judging them before he was throwing them mm-hmm. and he saw that one and that's that's the one he opened up then yeah <laughs> yeah we question the madness that shit looks rough um all right well i mean that's all i really want to talk about kubrick like there's we could, i could talk for hours about kubrick but let's just get into the Shining. I mean, we're 45 minutes almost in now. Let's finally talk about The Shining. Yeah. Um, this movie is – it's it's hitting every cylinder. Like, it looks amazing. It's directed amazing. It's – the performances, everyone is bringing it. And I find very few flaws with it. Like – Yes. Um, what I like about it is – okay, so it's a horror movie. It's a thriller in some scenes, it's a uh, slasher. In a couple, it's um, supernatural. Yep. I guess. Uh, yep. And I was going somewhere with this, but basically, what I was getting at is that on top of everything, it's a just a giant mystery. 
Like, at the end yeah. of the day, like, what is going on? Uh, what I like about this, uh, or basically horror movies nowadays, like, or even back then, okay? Like, yeah, the opening intro or the opening scene. Yeah, we get right into like, it. Like, well, no, hold on. You, the, the opening scene, you got to get scared. They got to throw something in there to get you scared, to get you in, you know, to show you what's interesting. It's, it can even reveal the villain. And I'm using Halloween as an example. It shows them uh, where he kills his sister immediately. And we're back at uh, Smith's Grove, you know, and he escapes. Wow, mm-hmm. that's been 15 minutes. This, it explains nothing to you at all. And it just kind of leaves you like, okay, is he going crazy? Is the hotel haunted? Like, you don't understand anything. And it doesn't just spoon feed it to you. Well, here's what I like about the beginning. Like, I say we get right into it because the opening shot of just that small island on the lake, and we're just zooming past it, and the score is kicking in. And the score is one that I've had a a weird relationship with it. Like, I come and go on how much I love it and how much it's – like, it's weird because I always took it as like a a French horn or a tuba for, like, the theme – but uh-huh. I, I've also read that it's a synthesizer. So, like, I don't know. Like, it's an organ. And I, I don't know. But I always it was like, this sounds like Godzilla theme. A little bit. A little bit. But then my the part that I like the most about it is when that horn kind of trails off. And then you get – it's just the shot of him driving up, up, up into, like, with further up we go. The, we're, like, we're in the stratosphere. Like, the clouds and the snow and everything. And then we get those moans of like a woman screaming kind of you know it's almost like uh like like you would imagine like uh in the witch like the just the kind of cackling and stuff but it's like it's almost as if it's like the souls of the overlook crying out as jack's driving further and further up and i love it so much The music is absolutely everywhere. And again, well, let's, I'm trying to stay on topic and let's get through this. Uh, we talked about, uh, what's the term called it? In uh, our last podcast we were in together, uh, just random cuts where it's just like a stinger. That's what you call mm-hmm. it. A stinger, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> where they use it in random moments in that movie, and this one, where the music, it's instead of it being stingers, it's the music tenses up and tenses up. And you're like, oh my yes. god, why am I on edge? Why am like he's just throwing a tennis ball at the wall? Why am, <laughs> did something happen and I didn't see it? It's, yeah, they I do a it. lot with the sound. The sound in this movie, the the one part that sticks out to me that I absolutely love the most is Danny on his tricycle, like when he's the first the time carpet, you see him. The hardwood. <laughs> Yes, we're following them like with the steady cam, and this was also one of the first few movies to use steady cam. So like we're and pioneering was, technology like, with this and movie. it was uh, handled by the person who invented it. Yes, he was the one filming yeah, it. The inventor of the steady cam was on set for this one. Yep. But yeah, when they're following Danny and he's you know hits the rug, hardwood floor, rug, hardwood, and it like cuts out almost completely. It's such a good like sound design. It's there's no music there because you don't need the music. It's tense no. just hearing that start because stop it's a, start it's a stop. Rhythm. Like it's a rhythm and music yes. is rhythm. It's the drum. Like section. I would love to see a trailer that uses that as the sound bed for this movie. Like just that that uh, hardwood floor sound and then the the moments of silence in between. It's so fucking good. And then of course, I love it when a movie trailer like, and I'm using a trailer for example when they take like. Uh, and again, I'm going to go back to Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Uh, Godzilla used um, – oh, God, I can't remember. I think it was like Bohemian Rhapsody or something like that. But – or maybe it's just a Queen song. Either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, during the monster fight, as the beat yep. goes, it – you know, like they're punching each other or biting each – it, it just makes it – I love it when it's on sync like that. Oh, yeah. Like I, I like when they use – sound design from the movie they just pick one little moment or one little sound to really drive that like uh, well you know we're talking about trailers now but like um the one i think of is like alien when he uses the siren as like the sound bed for the trailer or when we talked about uncut gems recently there's that one like 
almost like a break sound effect from that Kanye West song. And then like, that's the driving force of like the uncut gems trailer. But this right, movie, yeah. I feel like they're doing that tenfold with the sound design. Like there, and then there's odd choices too, for the score. Like there's that weird Chinese gong when, when uh, Danny first sees the, um, the, the shining uh, sisters in the hallway, it's, yeah. it's a weird choice. Like why a gong? My favorite instance of the score in this movie, by far, more so than the theme song, and I don't even know how to describe it. It's used a lot in the climax, but it's like, you know, when Wendy first sees uh, dead uh, Scatman Crothers on the floor. Okay, I have notes on that, because every, um, there's like a, it, okay, so when Wendy finds a Scatman, and... Mm-hmm. Wendy's trying to find Danny. Danny is currently being chased around. Uh, it changes themes when it goes to the Danny and Jack chase. It changes the score. I mean, there's remnants and it it lingers. But then when it cuts to Wendy, who is having a horrible time, by the way, She's just something changed. Out, seeing the yeah, weirdest something shit. changed. <laughs> the, the, I've been hearing these scores throughout the entire movie, and then something came new, up new right here in the last fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. It was like this weird chanting thing. Every time, and because I backed it up, every single time you heard that chanting, she was about to see a dead person, or she was about Mm -hmm. to experience something really awful. About to see a ghost or something, yeah. Yeah, like, it it was going to be awful. Yep. Um, This was, like, the first movie to really show me cinematography in a way that I hadn't seen before and like really helped me to understand, you know, composition and language and everything. It's so amazing. Like to see like when Jack's swinging the ax into the door, I have that in the, my notes too. And, and oh the camera gosh. follows through with yes. everything. It's so intense. Jesus. It's such a simple trick. And you know, yeah. nowadays a lot of movies won't do that because they don't want the camera to be like locked down and moving just left to right. They want to have that free movement, but you know, and I've you can see Kubrick is the one, you know, camera operating in those shots. Like you can see him, uh-huh. like the behind the scenes shots of him, like uh, holding the uh, the camera handle, and like you know, he he doesn't know when Jack's Jack uh, Nicholson's gonna swing back for the next swing either. Uh, and you can see him with anticipation. Yeah, and he's like whips the camera back, whips it forward. It's so fucking. It brings this sort of chaotic energy that like. You know, you don't see a lot in movies, and I not- feel like I've seen something re- like something like that recently. And this is throwaway. They, they do a little bit of it in Doctor is. Sleep. They do a little also, bit of Doctor Sleep. But I'm talking about like the uh, like it's someone swinging. Uh, God, I can't remember something I watched not too long ago. But the camera did the follow work with the instrument of whatever the person swinging versus, yeah, composition wise, it, it just makes it, it looks so good. Plus, you know, I mean, Kubrick's his affinity for like forced perspective and everything. Everything is in focus. Everything is driven to the center of that that focal plane on the on the lens. I was going to um, mention that too. Like, okay, so if you notice in this movie, almost everything is centered. A lot of shots, whatever yeah. you're supposed to be looking at, is in the very center frame, and it, the the set design around that center person is perfectly frames what you're supposed to be looking at. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like it, yeah. going down hallways, for example. Who walks directly in the middle of a hallway? Think about it. Like even if no yeah. one's down that hallway, in this movie, yeah. everybody's walking right in the middle, so it's all centered and stuff. But going back, yeah. fun fact: Jack Nicholson went through over sixty doors doing yeah. that scene because he was a trained volunteer fire fireman. fireman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they oh, had damn. to get in real doors because the problem. I'm going to get one on you. Too quickly. I'm, I'm going to get one on you that you didn't know. That's, what, that's my goal. <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. Most things I'm going to know. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. Um, speaking of the, more of the cinematography, though, like there's certain things that Kubrick chooses to do in this movie that I feel like a lot of directors and directors of photography wouldn't do. Like the one thing I'm thinking about uh, about in particular is when Danny goes into room 237, and you know. Uh, uh, Jack has his nightmare and Wendy comes to save him. And he's like, oh, I had this most horrible dream. Right. And, you know, she's consoling Jack in his chair. And then Danny comes in sucking on his thumb. When, when you know, we, we're behind Danny, but we're above him kind of looking down so we can see everybody in the room. I feel right. like any other DP would be low on the ground and just feel Danny's back 
as like the center point of that shot. You know, like we're following right behind him. Yeah, but then we're the above- extremely long. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say we're above him. So we cannot not only see Danny, but we can see Jack and Wendy way in the background. Right. And to me, that's like, oh, that's the lady from Room 237 walking right behind him. Like, that's the ghost of the Overlook walking behind Danny. Like, like first like person. A fore- yeah, like a foreboding presence. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I feel like most DPs wouldn't do stuff like that in a horror movie. Like, they they want to make – you know, everything, those tight shots, you get the most reaction. And there's a yeah, lot they, of wide shots in this movie. Chop it up. Like, uh, that's also a really, really long shot. Okay. So mm-hmm. like Jack's being consoled on the ground and they are blurry. Uh, that's mm-hmm. how far away they are. And cause I was, you know, Wendy was like, Jack, just go up to your room or sorry, Danny, just go up to your room. Uh, I'll be there in a second, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And she, he's just standing there and, She's consoling. She's like, why didn't you mind me? And is walking to him. Yeah. And it's almost realistic because it's not until she gets right up on him when like, oh shit, something's wrong type thing. Yeah. Where I feel like if anybody else, it would be cut between shots at Wendy telling Danny to go upstairs. I feel like today it would have been the camera behind Wendy and Jack and yep. a far shot of yeah. Danny walking in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it. Yeah. Just different ideas like that is what kind of goes crazy with me. Yeah, especially with like the long shots of this movie. What I think of is – I can't remember her name unfortunately, but the editor for uh, Mad Max Fury Road. I think we talked about this on the podcast before, but she won the Oscar for Best Editing that year and her advice was never cut unless you're getting new information. Like there's no reason to do back and forth unless you're getting new info that you can't get – um, from the previous shot. And I feel like they do that a lot in this movie. Like that shot in particular, we follow Danny all the way from the outside of that foyer, like all the way up to when he first meets uh, meets up with Wendy and she sees the bruising on his neck. And right then is when we flip and we break that 180 rule, which if you're not familiar, you know, the, the camera is on a 180 degree axis with whoever's right. in front of them. And when you flip that, you're letting the audience know things have changed. Subconsciously, things have changed. And that's when she stands up and she says, you did this and points to Jack, you know? Right. Like that's Which when also have she's getting new that. information. <laughs> I also have that as notes. I was like, oh, yeah, the face Wendy. he gives her is hilarious. He's like, yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> that's low. It's such a good reaction. That's my favorite uh, because literally he like, bitch. You woke me up from a night terror. Like yeah. I have been. Uh, <laughs> his what? reaction Are is you gold. Serious. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But no. That, and again, this was the movie where I learned about like the breaking of the one eighty and what that means. And like the 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 big example you can point to also is when uh, Jack and Grady are in the bathroom, and you know, and he's like, "Grady, you chopped your family up into little pieces," and he's like, "Oh, I don't have any recollection of that yeah, at all." The camera stayed on. Jack mm-hmm. until the and narrative like, you, slot. You're the caretaker, and then it flips. Yep. We go to the other side of that bathroom, which that bathroom set is one of the best okay, sets so, I've ever seen. Yes. Okay. Oh. I'm, I'm so glad because I was going to bring this up when we were talking about 237. Mm-hmm. The entire, let's say, the c- basic color palette of what you see mm-hmm. so far uh, up until this point has been reds, browns, oranges. Uh, a lot of earthy tones, like yeah, muted. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, even in the room that they're staying in, they're I guess they're a little sweet or whatever. It's mm-hmm. pretty generic. It's like white, uh, something else. Anyways, the two other, well, three other locations. Uh, not not talking about rooms. Sorry, three other rooms. We got mm-hmm. the gold ballroom. Which, Which of course is, is completely different. It's gold. Okay, to me, it's cool. is hideous. I think yes, that room is it, so ugly. It's Other than really the bar, bad. The, the bar just, looks the amazing. Bar is sick, especially the, the bar lights, is so like, good going around the mirrors. Yeah. Anyways. Yes. <laughs> okay. Then we got room two thirty seven, which takes a huge shift to purples, blues, greens. That bathroom is great looking too, but gold. that okay. that carpet first, is hideous. Yeah, that so dude, carpet. Dude, that's gross. like a bowling alley carpet. <laughs> it like, is a bowling alley carpet. <laughs> yo, so at, when, at first glance, I was like, yo, this bathroom is fucking ugly, but then I paused it because I was writing notes and I was like, yeah, actually this bathroom's kind of fire. It's, like, it, the, the green color is kind of sickly and it's very of the look, time. No, it's but fine. It's, also, it's because the toilet's green. If the toilet the wasn't green, green I, what, yeah. 
I agree. I would have loved it. If <laughs> why does the toilet got to be green? <laughs> like, okay, and then shifting again to the bathroom, which is a dope ass bathroom. We're talking about the it gold looks, room bathroom, the red room. Yes. Yes, it's it amazing. Looks so good, the red, just red and white, just. Well, it's like the first real pop of color in the movie. Like yeah. everything else, like you said, has been like muted, earthy tones, and we get like even the gold room doesn't look that colorful. No, like, the carpet was pretty crazy, but that was it. Yeah, yeah nothing yeah. insane. Yeah, no, I agree. The, the the like I said, the cinematography, the color, everything in this movie is is working top shelf. It's it's all running on full cylinders. It's amazing. Um, I I just want to talk about a, little, a few little things. I mean, we can talk about how much we love certain things, but just little things I took note of on this rewatch that I thought were funny. Um, Omen, you know, the the guy that gives uh, Jack the job, the uh, manager. Yes, looks like yeah. a discount JFK. No, nope. I never I have really. Put- my, Joe, I have in my notes right now. He looks like the, uh, oh god, the host of Will of Fortune. I don't know his yes, name. Yes, he looks like Pat Sajak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, it's written right here. I swear to God. I don't. I don't know why, but I just. I never really. He's a good looking guy, but it's the hair. Like the hair is like yeah. almost like a like a. It's, it might be a wig. I don't know. It might be a wig, but. It, he does, for some reason, I got JFK on this rewatch, and I could definitely see Pat Sajak. Um, yeah, that was the first thing I went to. So that's, that's glad we both got that. Um, we have this reoccurring bit on the show that uh, anybody that drinks milk in a movie, just a glass of milk, is usually a psychopath. Uh, yeah. And I noticed on this rewatch, Danny drinks a glass of milk when we first see him eating that peanut butter and jelly sandwich but at the table. He makes it up. <laughs> With a glass of chocolate milk. Well, Tony drinks a glass of chocolate milk. Yeah. At the end, so I don't know. Maybe do we count them yeah, as the same? Uh, maybe. I mean, well, you get more clarification on what, who, and what exactly Tony is in Doctor Sleep. Which well, tell me this, Dustin, in Doctor Sleep, does he drink white or chocolate milk? He drinks a lot of alcohol. I can't remember him drinking fish. any milk actually. Well, okay, what kind of alcohol? Bourbon. Uh, he's a he. He does do bourbon. I think he's more of a Scotch man. In uh, in uh, Doctor Sleep, though. All right. Well, if I, I guess I, I respect mean, it. Yeah. Um, I love the look of the Overlook Hotel so much in this movie. It's so massive, and like the wide shots we see of it, it's it's so dreadful looking. It's really upsetting because when you see that miniseries, that hotel looks like dog shit compared to this. It looked um, the miniseries looked too pleasant. It's too small, and the big problem I have with it. Is that it in the miniseries? It's like down in a valley. In this one, it's high up on a mountain, yeah. which makes sense. You're going out, way out of the way. You're like it's not as pleasant. Like you're surrounded yeah. by snow and everything. Yeah, I don't know. But I, no, like it's interesting over- too. What were you gonna say? No, I'm saying the overlook uh, in, in Kubrick's. It's it's almost okay. I want to say I don't want to say. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, medieval or anything like that it just kind of has that gothic looking it does have a very gothic kind of aura so if they made a log cabin gothic yeah this is what it would I be i can see that and it's just dreadful it's eerie it's yes uh, and well again, it is mostly fa- a facade like a lot of the sh- shots outside are not of the actual yeah, hotel I they're did see you know something like that yeah i saw that yeah. uh documentary on there uh yeah it's the one in the miniseries, it just looks too pleasant to be at. It's it doesn't look curvy, like a hotel. It, it looks just like a bed and breakfast. Yeah, I don't know. It looks <laughs> it almost looks um, like an awful plantation home or something. This might be little things that you didn't you might have picked up on uh, your your research, but did you notice Jack's tie when he's in the interview at the beginning of the movie? It's, it's like like I noticed it was uh it was like a someone knitted a tie. It's a knit for tie, him. but it's the hedge maze. It's Uh-oh. basically the hedge maze. Oh, don't get me fucking started. <laughs> don't get me started on this. That's the kind of stuff, like, when people are talking about, like, Kubrick's a perfectionist. But then again, that's probably more so on the uh, the wardrobe side of things. But even still, it's a nice little touch. Because well, it's such an Kubrick odd let, tie. Let, yeah, he let it in, so. Yeah, it's such an it. odd tie, like, to wear. Like, knitted ties in general. And I would not wear that shit to an interview. <laughs> like, no, it's, it's, it's too. Gotta impress him. It's too wide and it's too out there. It's too niche. I I just couldn't pull it off. It's also knitted. Like, yeah, knitted ties. Is, you you really got to be able to pull that off. Like yeah, yeah. Um, man. Okay, I, go, let's go on the hedge mates. Let's go ahead and get this out of the way. Okay, so you. Uh, this so is interesting. The, yeah, so all right, for the ahead. listener, 
when when JT was watching this movie, he was letting me know he was taking notes. You had a real affinity for this hedge maze. Look, okay, so I've known they <laughs> existed for the longest time, guys, but so many questions. I'm like, first off, why is that an attraction? Like, look, just it. You could have made a maze out of wood, something easier. Like, mm-hmm. if you wanted to get people lost. So, also, I had the question: Who was the guy that first invented it? And also, like, so he, <laughs> what does he do? He plants these bushes into certain patterns, and people are like, "What the hell?" And it's like, "Oh, well, in twenty years, you're going to be freaking out." So here's here's what I think. Like, I never thought about this until you brought it up. But it is weird that, like, you know, I I think what happened is when they because they say they built the hotel in like a what two year time span or something like three years. I'm thinking they just hauled bushes up there, but that's you know they just no. hauled bushes from another yeah, a second well, yeah, location. Of course. Yeah, th- as far as the the growth, like fully them, grown them, bushes yes. is what I'm saying. But I don't think they brought the, little like the it was actually designed like from scratch a maze. They didn't follow up a uh, template or anything to get you know they didn't Google generic hedge maze and yeah. then just did that. Fun fact: um, during shooting and stuff like that. They had to shout, and because they got lost, and people came in with a map or whatever to get them. Stanley Kubrick himself had they said, or he said, if I can't get lost in it, it's no good. We got to redo it. Yeah. And so he straight in went in, and after about an hour, he started yelling. He got lost. <laughs> See that so, they did not know, but that's pretty. Well, here's the thing about the head yes, maze. Fuck yeah. I get it as a tourist attraction because because like the hotel itself is a tourist attraction. I get that as like you know it's the seventies when the, we're filming this movie. The hedge maze has probably been around a lot longer than that. Um, right. My thing is it's it's just too big, like. It's it's it's, an, it's fine to have a hedge maze, but this thing when we get that top down view of the hedge maze, which I still to this day don't know how they filmed that shot. I, I do, I do, Dustin. I got oh, you know how me. they filmed it. I know how they filmed it. I know how they filmed it. Okay, okay. So, Is it miniatures? No. Okay, so they filmed the top down view of the uh, model of the hedge maze, right? Okay. Then they made just that center. If you look, pull up an image, just the center of the hedge maze where. It, it shows Windy little bitty tiny Wendy and Danny walking yeah. in. That was actually filmed in a – it's essentially these uh, four giant apartment complexes that uh, make a square. Okay. And the film crew oh, they were just overlaid on the, the roof. Image. Yeah, the film crew was on the roof of this uh, apartment complex really high up in the air uh, and shot them just playing. Okay, that and makes then, sense. And then they overlaid it on the actual model – so when it overlays into them actually in the actual hedge maze going from top down, the outside of that shot is still the model that Jack's looking at. Right. That makes sense. I just – I was – you know, every time I see this movie, I'm like, they filmed this shit in the 70s. There's no way they could have got a bird's eye view this high yeah. up, like this perfect. It's an, and, and I love too that the shot right before that is Jack looking over the little model of the hedge maze in the hotel and it's like he's looking down on them. It's yep. so fucking brilliant, and that shot is beautiful. Be- yes, like, it's absolutely. It's so got a lot strange. of great cinematography, and the wide shots are some of the best. It's amazing. I'm trying um, to think some wide shots other than that one that pops out. Okay, going back to hedge mages. So, like, <laughs> who keeps up with them? You know, like after so long, like I know, like after about two weeks, like you know, the ones I have outside, like they need to be trimmed up and shaped up. You tell me, you have a full staff of just hedge people or like i think so man and i think i guess I mean, after you've worked there for so long you kind of know uh yeah. look i don't know it just seems are like we, way too much sure maintenance real for no reason hedges they could very well um, just be like you know fake bushes that they don't have to trim up i mean that would make sense so you don't have to worry about the like the the weather like it getting too cold or like getting snowed in or something you know i mean sure if you want to <laughs> take that way out dustin <laughs> i'm just trying to think of like in universe what makes the most sense um uh just not having it i think would be <laughs> i think that you would just don't like the mazes sense. is the I problem just don't think, uh, look man i mean they I gotta know, do maybe. something they don't have the internet back then why not go fuck around in a hedge maze for an hour that's probably the you know what the person who invented hedge maze has probably had the same problem and he's like i'm gonna go outside or and- he won an excuse to like 
he needed a place to go to like fool around with a girl and he's like if i make a maze big enough no one could possibly like, find these bushes <laughs> aren't big enough i can't <laughs> i can't <laughs> um, i can't have sex with my neighbor so you you're you're obsessed with the hedge maids i'm obsessed with the elevator in this movie because the shot i mean it's it's one of the most iconic shots in film history but right. the elevator doors being pushed open just by the sheer weight of this blood that pours out of it is insane to me. Like, I think what, what I like about it so much is that there's so much mystery behind it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, okay, so for example, the girls, okay, one of the girls there, and then you should see their dead bodies. Oh, they were cut up with an axe. Mm-hmm. Why is there a bunch of blood in the elevator? Well, when there's so bodies- much blood because it's just like, you know, Grady was not the first one to yeah. murder his wife, and there's like it's the well. It's also implied that it's like the blood of like all the people that have died there, or like the right graveyard it's built on top um, of. It's also, also just fun, scary as hell. Yeah. Also, fun fact: uh, because Kubrick used real blood, it caused electrical problems for all the glucose in the blood. Well, it's it's amazing just in that like okay when you film. A shot like this, you know, you've got you you do all the 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 engineering work up front. You test it out, make sure it works, and then you try it out for real. I'm just thinking they could, I, maybe they did only get this in one take. I but don't see how. Yeah, I don't either. I and yeah, when, I when they show the like try. the furniture bobbing up and down, just yeah. in like the the buoyancy of the, it's so much blood. And then to think, oh, we got to redress this and do it again to get a second take. We didn't get it. And then how amazing it is that that blood washes over the camera and completely blacks it out. It's yeah. fucking amazing. It's you so good. The clean up, Jesus Christ. No, that's what I'm saying. It's like See, I, I feel like I'd be like, hey, just in case, hit record. What if this is <laughs> you gotta have a amazing. couple of those sets already made up that you just fly in. You don't have to clean it up. But like, I, like I don't know what. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the person who would be in charge of cleaning that up i don't know what their official title would be but like yeah they got that shot like, that shot is used so well in this movie and it's not really a spoiler but it you do see it again that same shot in dr sleep uh-huh. but it's unfortunate because it's to a much less effect like it, you, you see it and then the character that's like seeing it's just like huh and keeps walking but so, it's like <laughs> how do you like? How do you feel about something? Okay, and and I'm saying this because okay, because of course Doctor Sleep being a sequel to The Shining, did it need a blood filled elevator just to be like, oh look, we're The Shining? Well, I, again, you haven't seen it, and if our listeners haven't okay, seen it, so I don't want to spoil so too much. Let me, but- expl- let me do something else then. So let's take Halloween 1978 and Halloween 2018. Okay. Okay. I loved, absolutely loved the scene where. Her granddaughter looks out the window, just like in and sees Band- it. Yeah, and sees, sees Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael, and it's yeah, it's Jamie Lee Curtis. I laughed in the movie theater. It, yeah. it, it just struck me funny. Uh, that's fun. Okay, and then mm-hmm. at the end climax fight, when yeah. Michael throws her off the balcony, yeah, he looks down, and then the granddaughter walks in the front door, and he turns, looks back down, she's gone. I like that. My theater cheered at that man. It was great. But, but the scene that was kind of cringe to me, and it, I hate saying this because I absolutely love Jamie Lee Curtis. Can I guess? I think I know what you're going to say. Yes, go ahead. Is it when she says, Happy Halloween, Michael? Yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It this is man a, has been, This yeah. man has tormented you all, like, all, like for over half of your life, and you're going to yeah. take that moment to fucking catchphrase? Like, oh, come on. I loved uh, Jamie. Gr- okay, let's talk about the Shining though. Um, but yeah, so doing remake sequels, whatever. That's a certain width of time apart. Mm-hmm. We tend to try to go for the classics, like oh, the blood filled elevator. Uh, we're bringing back Red Rum, unless if it has something to do with the plot, then yes, of course, bring it in. But mm-hmm. just to have that for the sake of no, having I, it, I will say. It it is all needed for the plot. Like it's not just there is some fan servicey stuff in that movie, but in those instances, yeah, it, Red Rum, all that stuff. It is it is uh, related to the plot directly. Okay, and great. it's 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 a great scene. Don't get me wrong, but it's just it's the way they do it. It's kind of disappointing, but it's wasted on a 
not the viewer audience, but the <sighs> cast that was or it's it's hard character. to even say without spoiling it. Yeah, to be honest, with you. <laughs> let's just move on from the from Doctor Sleep. Yeah, um, um I we t- we talked about like how this movie can be like unintentionally hilarious at times, which. I don't know what that says about you as a person or like, you know, uh, what the movie is saying. But like the part that I laugh at the most is when Jack and uh, Danny and uh, Wendy are first driving up to the Overlook. And, you know, Sh- Shelly's like, uh, Boy, we must really be high up. The air feels so different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just like shut up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He <laughs> hates his family so much in this movie. But the part that makes me laugh so hard is when he's described. He has to describe to Danny what the Donner family was. What was the Donner party? They were a party of settlers in covered wagon times. They got snowbound one winter in the mountains. They had to resort to cannibalism in order to stay alive. You mean they ate each other, huh? They had to, in order to survive. Jack, don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. You saw it on the television. The look that Jack Nicholson gives right when he says that, he gets that... that famous Jack Nicholson smile yeah. and the raised eyebrow and he's like see it's okay he saw it on the television yeah. it's so fucking Dude, Jack funny. Nicholson uh, <laughs> again we can talk about his thing but let's let's finally hit on him for a second sure he absolutely like I mean this is his famous role like this and uh, I think he's known for this and Wolf right the werewolf movie that he did <laughs> I'm joking by the way <laughs> I mean, he yeah, looks no, like a werewolf in this movie at times. I mean, he's he's that had a lot a of, of, course of movies like prior to this too, yeah, like no, Wolf was Cuckoo's Nest, and, uh, because I can't even remember what it was called. Yeah, <laughs> no, especially when he's in the bathroom in the the red room bathroom, he looks like a oh, werewolf man, in some I'm, of the shots. I'm gonna look it up and send it to you. But either way, this is the is what he's known for, and, and th- just the monologues of him by himself. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes in this entire movie is when he meets Lloyd, the bartender. Uh, God, just yeah. Just a long shot. Yeah. It's from his right of him walking up to the bar. So you see the gold room in the background. He sits down. Mm-hmm. And he, well, first he looks, because again, he hasn't drank in five months. He looks behind the counter, no yep. alcohol. He sits down, face uh, puts his head face in his hands, and says, I would give my soul for yep. a glass of beer. And then he does the whole like shrug yep. and it's a single frame. Like it's just looking at him again, centered, but it's just a headshot of him centered and those facial expressions, the conversation. Uh, then that's when Lloyd pops up and he has a dialogue. Hi, Lloyd. A little slow tonight, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is, Mr. Torrance. What would be? What was so curious about is he's talking to Lloyd like he's known him for a long time, which hints back to the end shot of the entire movie, but you don't know, because that's also yeah. how people just talk to bartenders sometimes. Well, I, I love that, like, because, of course, there's nobody else here in the first time he's talking to Lloyd that, like... He does have this sort of relationship of like you know the the regular and the bartender, but also he like tiptoes around what he really wants to yeah. talk about, you know. Like he 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 has that moment where he's like, "Here's to five miserable months on the wagon, and all the irreparable harm that it's caused me." Yeah, like he wants to vent to somebody is what it seems like. And, and I love because he's like, I never heard him or whatever. And he goes on this whole defensive thing. And then he kind of like smacks his lips and looks around. He's like, I did hurt him once, okay? I did yeah. hurt him a little. Yeah. He gets kind of like, <laughs> okay, okay, maybe just a little bit. I, I don't like. <laughs> Lloyd, can you keep a secret? I did hurt him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anybody, though. 
It's so good. It's so good. Okay, so he talks about uh, hurting him and stuff <laughs> like that. It seems like he's trying to vent, mm-hmm. right, about uh, this whole thing. And Oh, there it is. He keeps saying, like, and she won't let me forget it. Like, he's like, it was yeah. three years ago. And he talks, oh, gosh. And then when he talks about, like, the tiniest bit of uh, uh, force used could have just changed mm-hmm. everything. And then Lloyd's just looking yeah. at him like, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, I love he's like the, the, what like the pounds yeah, yeah, per yeah. inch That's per second to, yeah. per second. Exact it's so fucking quote. good. That's why I was drawing a blank there. But yeah, yeah, it's so, it's so good. good. He like snaps his fingers. He like he's like yeah, oh. like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> like he acts with his entire body, like his every yes. muscle in his face or his facial expressions. He acts at everything. Well, Nicholson was was Kubrick's first choice for the role of Jack, and it's you know it's interesting because Stephen King, who maybe he's he's right in the sense he said that the reason he doesn't like Nicholson as being cast is the whole point of Jack Torrance is he's supposed to go from this you know recovering alcoholic loving father to full blown crazy, and when you see Nicholson, you know right away that dude's gonna go crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like from the jump, he's gonna go crazy. Um. I, I didn't know about this either, but do you want to hear some of the other choices that Kubrick had in mind if Nicholson weren't able to do it? Who? So Robert De Niro, which I can kind of see. Yeah. Um, an interesting one, Robin Williams. Ooh. Who I also could kind of see doing this. Uh, and Harrison Ford, which I feel like maybe uh, maybe Harrison, Harrison Ford, Ford could do this. I would have pitied him more than uh, um. I feel like I would have hated uh, Jack more if it was Harrison Ford. Yeah, I would uh, honestly no, I would have pitied because I don't know Jack, like Harrison Ford just kind of has that face that like you feel sorry for. You know, like see, I'm kind of on the edge. He always looks so hardened to me that I find him hard to relate to. Like he looks, you know, uh, it just weathered and aged and like hardened and angry every time I see Harrison Ford. <laughs> I, I mean, I can see that. So I don't know, but we can both agree that like it couldn't be anybody else. Yeah, well, some no, obviously not. Some of the people that Stephen King wanted was uh, John Voight, which I can maybe see. Christopher Reeve, Superman himself. I don't Ooh. know how well that worked. Um, maybe, and uh, someone I'm not too familiar with, Michael Moriarty. I don't, I don't really know who that is. Wait, who was, maybe uh, who was face. Stephen King's first choice? Stephen King wanted someone like he said his personal picks were John Voight, Christopher Reeve, and Michael Moriarty. Hmm, and I'm trying to think Christopher of- Reeve maybe. It would be. I don't know how, how well he would play up like this scene. We're talking about in particular, like the bar scene. I don't know yeah. how well that would have worked. Um, I'm trying to think of anybody else, but it's so hard to get. You know, to let's even talk think about, about it. Scatman Crothers. Like my man, God, Yo, I love this dude. He, I absolutely love this dude. Dick Halloran is so fucking good as a character. Like in this movie, he's so likable. He's so charming, and I love that he is able to like. You know, when we first see him, he's so upbeat. He's almost overly friendly. Um, right. The one thing – I'll, I'll get to my point, but I, I want to side for a second. Something I never really noticed. You know when he's talking to Wendy first when he goes into the kitchen? He's like, Mrs. Tarsh, your husband introduced you as Winifred. Now, are you a Winnie or a Freddie? Okay. No, no, no. Wait. Stop. Stop right there because <laughs> I paused the movie to go back, listen to it again. I immediately tried to find uh, other uh, streaming services that this was playing because I needed subtitles. Yes. And I couldn't (laughs) find it until later. And I was like, damn it, I'm just going to write over that. I don't know what he said. It's so strange. I've I've never really picked up on it until this rewatch, but who names their daughter (laughs) Freddie? It's such a strange – like, I get, is your real name Winifred? That would make sense, but he said, "Are you a Win- Winnie or a Winifred or a Freddie?" Those are very the, strange. Those are the that's the first time I've ever heard as of Winifred being even being a name. I learned that it, it, is Wendy short for something. I thought it was just Wendy. Well, Wendy can be short for Winifred. I have heard that. I've never in my life heard of a woman named Freddie that no, goes no. by Wendy. <laughs> that just makes no sense. Very absurd. It's like Anyways, Richard and Dick. I don't know how that became a thing. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, but the, the point I was going to get to, though, is he, Scatman's able to be this really lovable, charming character. And then the second he gets alone with Danny, he has this very – like the first thing he says is, do you know how I 
knew your name was Doc or something like that, and it's very well, foreboding. Like it's scary. Well, it's because how, it's probably something. See, the way I see it is, and I actually have it in my notes here when he talks about like how many other people has he met with the shining? You know what I mean? Like it's only been him and his. Well, grandmother. he talks about his grandma, yeah. but yeah, Again, I, I think he sees that Scat- it's very strong in Danny. It, that and Scatman is old in this movie, and he's talking about his grandmother, so he probably hasn't felt anyone else have the shining possibly for a very very long time so probably freaked him out next okay i wasn't gonna okay basically when he talked about him and his grandmother i was like i want to see that movie you know okay so we're talking about it being in the set like this was filmed in 79 it came out in the 80s uh scatman is uh, he doesn't have an age in the movie but he's older okay and i was like i want to see that movie uh, maybe have a civil rights uh, um, plot going behind it and at first I was like mm. ah, that might kind of be too much but then the bathroom scene where they say the n-word three times in quick succession I was yeah. like okay well I stand by it like I would love to see a background story of uh, Doc maybe him Do you and his think- grandmother and stuff like that do you think Grady knew Dick Halloran? Like, was Dick working at the Overlook when Grady killed his family? Well, I mean, they talk about how he's been, or it, the way they talk, it seems like Doc's been working there for years and years and years. Yeah, but I don't think Dick ever, like, con- makes himself connected with Grady at all. I don't think directly, anyway. No, like, they, as far as they know, they haven't necessarily. Or in the movie, they don't talk about each other, or Grady does, but Scabby yeah. has, he doesn't recollect that, yeah. Um, but I mean, he, okay, now you got me, now I know why he just asked the question because now I'm thinking about it. See, that would be an interesting movie. I mean, uh, HBO is currently working on uh, a series uh, called The Overlook that I don't know what the uh, tagline is for it, but, or the log line, I should say, but it would be interesting to see, like, more of these characters because I love Dick Halloran like he's a great character he's great in this movie there's no one like Scatman Crothers um, for real like he was yeah and man he has one moment in Vivian Kubrick's documentary he's only in the, the the documentary for one little interview bit and he is just crying tears and she's like what you know what did you like about this movie he said the people he's like everyone this was the best experience of my life and he's like wow genuinely teared up like such a kind like gentle old yeah. man it's I, I um, love him in this movie he uh actually did a little look up on him uh just to see i was like have i seen him in anything else there was one thing that is he's, he's in the twilight zone movie that's what it was uh yeah in the spielberg segment he, i think he also uh one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and he is played. <laughs> he voiced a character in the Aristocrats in 1970 called Scat Cat. Yep, which I thought was Scat Cat fun. Yep, and he voiced some Transformers and other things. Yeah, but his he art- also has one of my one of the funniest lines of this movie to me um, when he's showing. Uh, uh, Wendy and Danny the pantry. And he's like, we've got forty seven chickens, thirty six steaks, or whatever. And he said something about prunes. He goes, you know, Mrs. Turris, you got to keep regular if you want to be happy. And I'm like, this dude basically just said, you got to shit if you want to so be this happy. This dude just advertised. <laughs> you know, Miss Torch, you got to shit a lot if you really want to be upbeat. <laughs> Come on, kid, let's go eat some ice cream. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so good. <laughs> another thing, uh, one thing that didn't make sense, and maybe you can shed some light on it, uh, the ice cream scene. He's explaining mm-hmm. uh, the shining stuff, and Danny's like, "What's in room two thirty seven? And then he explains, like, you know, well, bad things happen; it leaves a remnant. He's like, "It sounds like he says uh, it's like when someone burns toast. Burns toast. And yeah. I'm like, but he doesn't give the example on how it relates to burnt toast. I, yeah, he doesn't really make a direct connection. And but I was like, he, did the, he the just... line right after that, he says. <laughs> If things went a little differently, you know, I think he's basically saying if you get to the point where you burn toast, there was probably one thing you could have done differently that didn't lead right. to you burning toast. Cause, cause right? Like, did he just uh, did he just compare a murder suicide to <laughs> yeah. burning toast? Yeah. 
Well, in this instance, it's like Danny opening the door to 237 is him, you know, turning the toaster on too long or whatever. Like, that, it's yeah, leading down yeah, the road of that the burnt toast. Burn, but, yeah. no, I love that little monologue. He's like, you know, some places are – uh some places are like people, some shine and some don't. It's such a great quote. Yeah. Like that's that a was really interesting. That's a tombstone quote, like your uh epitaph right there. That's a yeah. brilliant fucking line. Um there was something else about this scene that I was wanting to bring up. Uh oh, and I love how I was like, What's in room two thirty seven? And Scatman's pretty much just all like Uh nothing. Uh <laughs> Like, he's very like, coy. Yeah, he's like, he's like, yeah, nothing's in there, but don't you fucking go in that room. You understand? <laughs> I love when Daddy's like, you're scared at 237, ain't you? And he's like, no, I ain't. And he's clearly visibly scared. He's like, nah, dude. That's what I'm saying, man. This nah, movie's you're really scared, funny. You're, you're scared at 237. All right. Yeah, it's so, so um, good. So let's, again, we're going to, I want to talk about Scat because he's only in a few scenes. Yeah. Uh, right after that, the next time we see him is when <laughs> he gets the, uh, 911. Yep. Shining call, right? Yep. And one of the this best man, shots of the movie. Yo, my man has the best artwork. God, yeah. In his room. <laughs> okay. Like, he has, and that's, re- I was like, dude, turn your hard drive back on and so I can watch this because I was streaming it and they blurred it because it was like Comcast streaming service, whatever. And it's such an innocuous fucking thing. It's just a it, painting of a, a girl's painting. tits. Like, that's it. It is a painting of beautiful naked black women like and there's and it starts there and it pans down because it's above you're basically the shot's going to lead to looking at the tv of a news Mm -hmm. broadcast whatever and the painting's above his tv so it pans down from the wall naked picture shows the tv talking about the snowstorm pans the dock Who's laying in bed, and he has a, another one which is massive. Oh no! Above I, his, bed. I love that. Like you see Scatman, and yeah, they zoom out, and then you see the naked woman painting above his bed, and then they cut to his point of view from the TV, and then there's another painting of a different woman. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. If I was oh, still man. living the bachelor life, I would have those paintings in my room. But Hell absolutely, yeah. absolutely, it, it, it'll have to be. It's not just a picture I'm going to frame too. Like someone had to paint this by hand. It's, what I want. so great man someone took their time on so this great work. um um but yeah he gets the sos call uh does does his eyes do they do an effect on his eyes when he like starts staring off uh, real wide or is that just a lighting thing i think it's just a light like i know what you're talking about because he kind of his eyes almost could. like rumble out of his skull a little bit like well no it's like it seems like it's almost like <laughs> this sounds really shitty but you know when dogs get like cataract and it's kind of like cloudy <laughs> yeah I mean that could just okay, be old age as well. I mean he's an older shit, man, so right. you know. But when he when he was in a certain angle, which well, actually no, it didn't even change angle. At one shot when he's looking downwards towards the TV, mm-hmm. I didn't notice it. So I was like, maybe his eyes they they do something with his eyes or something. And then he looks up towards the light when he's trying to like, I guess he's talking to Danny at that point. Mm-hmm. It could just be the light that because now he's looking at a bulb. <laughs> it could just yeah. be playing with me, but it's probably what it, it is. It's like probably it a, a light right stuff. out of frame. Yeah, to give that look. Because yeah, as far as special effects goes, I don't think there's a single special effect. I think everything is just practical. Well, I mean, like we talked about the bird's eye view of that hedge maze. That's technically a special effect. So there's probably some here and there for the most part. But yeah, I mean, this is a very bare bones movie. Yeah, and I think that's a minimalist. I think that's. He, I don't know. Well, I mean, that's why this movie's going to be timeless. All day. This movie's definitely exactly. going to be timeless because it's it age it ages like a fine wine, man. Every time you see it, it gets better. Look, that um, was that well, was forty years ago. Okay, yeah. so CGI. Now, forty years from now, the CGI we have now is going to look like shit. Yeah, absolute dog Everybody shit. Man, this sucks. absolute dog shit. <laughs> um, man, I this is so frustrating. We're all, we're an hour and a half in already, and I still have so so much I want to talk about. Um. I just want to – let's – look, we've already talked about how great this movie is. I could be here for at least another two hours just talking about the yeah, movie. Right. There's something I noticed on this rewatch that I thought was really funny that I never noticed before. Um, the the guy that uh, Dick calls to get the snow plow to borrow, the uh, auto, like, rental guy. Yeah, what was that whole scene thing? Like, what – it just seemed like a cut of him getting ready, him on a plane, yeah. him landing. It just seemed like a lot of – well, here's unnecessary. Here's what I never noticed. Did you notice the other patrons in this shop? Whenever he's the guy walks in to answer the phone and Dick's on the other line, the guy in the corner 
like right into the front door is just staring at this like swimsuit calendar like <laughs> there's no he doesn't do anything like the guy comes in to answer the phone and this guy is just staring <laughs> it's so <laughs> fucking weird I thought that was a cut I thought it was just a uh, picture and I was like maybe he's changing the uh, no that's what I thought too maybe he's month. gonna flip it to, it's the wrong month or something no this dude's just staring <laughs> well you know um, when Jack is eating his lunch at the overlook or in the lobby right at the beginning of the movie oh yeah he's looking at a playgirl yeah he's looking at a playgirl yeah that's, and someone so pulled funny. up that cover, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and there the taglines on the set, or what do you? I don't know what you call them. Is like, uh, I don't know, like Cosmopolitan. We like rate your sex game yeah. in this quiz or whatever. Yeah. Okay, one of them is something like uh, something about studies about parents sleeping with their kids. Like yeah, something I did, I did hear about or something that. Yeah. Like that. yeah. So there's a hint of not only was Jack physically abused, but sexually abused. But I was like, that's too subtle. I think it's possible that maybe he abused Danny. I mean, it's possible. They never really get into it, into that. I mean, physically he did, clearly. But I I feel like, I feel like, and this is just my opinion. I mean, I don't want to read too much into this, but if it was sexually, I feel like he would be more predatory towards Danny, but well, he seems completely separated. There's and, that scene where he's he's in bed and Danny goes up to get yeah, his fire truck. That's a really that, unsettling. Yeah, yeah, it seems. Yeah, but it, when I watched it, it seemed unsettling in the fact of you know Jack going crazy. Yeah, you know, like as far as like physical violence, not sexual violence. Yeah, but, you know, like even with my kid, like he'll walk in and say what's up in the mornings, like tell us good morning, but like come here and we just hang out for a second. Like yeah, it's. Yeah, it's. I guess it was unsettling because I know I'm watching a horror movie. Like, I don't yeah. want something bad to happen. But as far as the sexual like abuse, I didn't see any of that. I didn't see no hints of it or anything. Yeah, I mean, it's the seeds are there, but they never they never go any further past than that. Like, you could see it that way. You could interpret it that way. But I don't know if that's what Kubrick's trying to do or not. Um, yeah. Let's let's anyways. let's get towards the ending because, like I said, we could be here all day. We haven't even talked about like right. the subliminal like messages in here, like the TV that doesn't have a power cord, or people entering a room yep. and coming out like a- a- another place where they shouldn't physically be able to go. Like, there's a lot of great the, stuff like that. But during the tour, they almost got hit by a car, yep. and then it cuts to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> th- th- this is all stuff you like. If you're interested in like this stuff, there is some good things to get out of that room to 37 doc, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, yeah, this movie, it it gets better with every rewatch. You'll find new things to really love about it, but let's talk about the ending. So uh, like you said, uh, Danny does a shining call all the way from Colorado, Colorado to Florida to Dick. Uh, Dick gets on a flight, comes out there to try and save them. He's murdered immediately. (laughs) Like it's, yeah. I love that we have to see him get on get the uh, plane ticket, get on the uh, airplane, get rent the snowplow, drive through the snow, see that wrecked uh, eighteen wheeler and the the beetle, get all the way up there, and then within twelve seconds of walking in, <laughs> yeah, I um, fucking got okay. So in that scene, that's where uh, they climb. Uh, at that point, uh, Danny is already out of the window from the bathroom. Yep. Uh, I didn't, I mean, I guess my, I don't know. I feel like my first instinct would not to be go right back into the house. Yeah. But I mean, where's he going to go? Say, but like, he's going to die yeah, right. in the I'm blizzard. I'm thinking like he'll, he would die. Yeah. Um, and, but from there, that's the only thing that's the, they heard Doc pulling up. Yeah. Jack leaves to go take care of Doc. Yep. So he is no longer trying to get in the bathroom. And Wendy is can't fit through this little window. Yep. But the snowcat gets parked right outside that window. And you can't <sighs> tell me that Wendy couldn't have waved down like, yo, yeah, you know what I, I mean? Th- like, I think at that point, Dick was already inside and Wendy was like, I mean, think about what Wendy just went through. Like she, yeah, her husband almost like, just a- axed through a door to kill her. Her son's out in a blizzard. Like, and something, yeah. something somebody pointed out too, that I never really thought about, but when Jack is hacking through that bathroom door 
you know, and we see Wendy giving Shelley Duvall giving the one of the best performances in a horror movie I've yeah, ever she's seen. Absolutely phenomenal. She there's I mean it's not intentional, but she raises her hand to like kind of cover her face a little bit. And you get a, a nice shot of her wedding ring, and it's like a reminder of like, dude, this is her husband yeah. hacking through the door, the father of her Jesus, child. Yeah. It, it's so fucking brilliant. Like But yeah, uh when Danny uh <laughs> telepathed all the way from uh Colorado to Miami, watching it as a kid, I was like, yo, why is this kid like I don't wanna watch this kid have a seizure? Yeah. This is weird. Like <laughs> It takes okay. a lot of energy to get from Colorado it, it, to Florida, man. Yeah, it didn't take it. it yeah, it, I didn't get that until now. Yeah, and this rewatch was, yo, he's about to like swallow his tongue because he's reaching out. To it's a long Miami, distance call. Like, he's on roaming yo, charges. Dude. It's yeah, that bill's dude, gonna be it, crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm. <laughs> no, I I love the way they portray The Shining in this movie, where you, it's just subtle flashes of stuff like, yeah, and it's not a it's not a foresight. Uh, Doc kind of talks about how, like, I can, you know, get feelings or something like that. It's not like he knows the future or anything like that. Because one of the biggest things about the movie is like, oh, well, if Doc has a shining, why didn't he see that axe coming? Yeah. Well, that's what's so shitty about that miniseries is that, like, Doc's powers and those, like, w- everybody knows about it. Like, they, they, like, Wendy's even like, hey, did, did Jack get the job? Yep, he's on his way now. Like, they do that a little bit in this movie, too, but, like, he doesn't talk to Wendy about it. He talks to Tony about it. And yeah, it's Tony and Danny. Yeah. Tony is telling Danny that, that he yeah, got the it's job. It's not people just openly talking. It's so, about, like, yeah, that, that we'll get, we'll talk powers. about the miniseries a little bit more in a, in a bit, but yeah, it's so bad. Yeah. Um, One thing I want to bring up, uh, the use of mirrors in this movie. Yeah. Okay. I first noticed it in the scene where Wendy cooked Jack breakfast. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it cuts to her coming in the door and the camera is stationary. So it just pivots around. She's like, yeah, talking about the eggs or whatever. And then the camera stays fixated on a mirror, which is angled at Jack Lang and Betty wakes up. You know, they have a nice conversation, a good 30 seconds of this one still shot looking into a mirror. Yep. Okay. I thought it was phenomenal. I was like, that's a really cool shot. Wrote it down in my notes. Next. After, Wendy told Jack that a woman in 237 choked Danny. He goes to check it out. She's panicking in the room. He knocks on the door to say that, you know, no one was there. Mm -hmm. The hallway or the door is like in a little corridor thing. So it's kind of like a hallway leading to the door. Yeah. There on the, if you were opening the door on your left, there's a mirror station there. Yep. Okay. And then when you open the, when she opens the door again, Jack's head, like it's uses of mirrors. And stuff like that is absolutely phenomenal. Again, I was shout out to mom. I was talking to her about that on the phone earlier. And I was telling her about, yeah, there's something about it. And I think you told me this a long time ago on how the movie can be played backwards at the same time as forwards or something like that. Yeah. I I don't know how much I buy into that, that theory, but I, I see where you're going. I, I was giving her a brief description of it. I was like, yeah, the thing, like it mirrors itself. And then she was like, yeah, and it's playing the same forward as it is backwards, kind of like Red Rum, right? And I was like, yeah. holy shit, mom. <laughs> and the big play in the mirrors, I've noticed the amazing shot so far, strategically done by them, and then really hits home when the whole Red Rum reveal when she sees it in the mirror. Mm. And I just thought that that's something to be talked about. Well, it's, it's a great moment. Like, when she, you know, Red Rum is, is not really a big thing in this movie it's it's i mean it is but it's not all over the movie it's really that one scene and like yeah. uh you know in the miniseries it's a little more played up but i love that it's like as soon as she reads it it's murder we do that snap zoom in the score yeah. that i was talking about that i love the little like wood block or whatever that is that plays kicks in and right then is when jack starts hacking through the door like it's that's your yep. that's the starting part of the that's climax the it's, it's yeah, right there it's about to kick off yeah anyways let's let's get back to so so dick comes in through the front door the overlook uh Jack kills him. Danny screams in horror as Dick's getting killed. And then my what I call my favorite shot in all of cinema history is that 
slow motion shot of Jack Nicholson just rising up with the evilest fucking look I've ever seen. Yes. It's, and the blood on his it's bald spot so from Wendy. It's so fucking good. But he, it's really he good. chases Danny through the hotel and eventually out to the hedge maze. Uh, Wendy seeing all the ghosts and crazy shit, the blood elevator. The one thing I find kind of silly is like the cobwebs and the skeletons that she sees. That makes lobby. sense to me, but it, it just felt very sure. Scooby Doo ish to me. Yeah, but what are you gonna do? Uh, anyways, Jack's chasing him, uh, chasing Danny through the hedge maze. Danny eventually realizes he can cover his tracks uh, and get out of there. And the whole time, Jack is just getting. Further and further, further, like deteriorated in cognitive thought. Like he's get, he's almost getting to the point where he's just like an animal. Like it's just primal screaming. He's not even saying words anymore. Ah! Ah! Yeah, he uh, he developed he developed a limp from the falling down the yeah, stairs. Yeah, he in a head wound. Uh, Had his hand slashed by the kitchen kitchen knife. Yeah, so he is just this like. He's curling over himself with this axe, chasing his five-year-old son through a blizzard. To chop him up yeah. with an axe. Yeah. I mean, in, a, in the middle of a blizzard. Yeah. In the middle, you know what? Even worse, in the middle of a hedge maze. In a hedge maze, in a blizzard, <laughs> on a bump, on a log. Like I'll take a blizzard. I'll take a blizzard any day. <laughs> uh, hedge anyways, maze. Uh, Danny manages to get out. Uh, him and Wendy get in the snow cat that that Dick brought and escape. Uh, Jack crumbles to the snow, screaming in, in anger or horror or confusion, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then we just and then a, cut a to amazing transition, hard cut, like just a hard cut to daytime. Oh, and the one of the creepiest images of all time, just frozen dead Jack Nicholson with like a cannibalistic, like uh, you know, uh, early caveman just lowered brow look on his face like it's he's yeah, dead it, it, it's you've seen the image and if not like it's it's so iconic yeah uh, i like the quick snap because this movie really uses uh uh time stamps a lot yeah. like it'll say yeah. one month later or tuesday. tuesday it doesn't even tell you how long yeah. it's been just tuesday uh, for this not to do that, and they just cut to oh, it's a hard to cut too, and you get that little like fluttering key yep. stinger. It's so mm-hmm. fucking good. It's one. Of, it, it'll definitely give you chills. Yeah, and then we final shot of the movie is a slow push into this framed photo on the wall inside the hotel of the Overlook Hotel celebrating. I think it's New Year's Eve, nineteen twenty one, maybe nineteen twenty one. No, it was a fourth of July. Fourth of July, you're right. Uh, a, a party that we're having in the gold room, and you realize the face of the patron in the very front of the photo is Jack Nicholson. So it's implied. But another thing about it, but okay, so Jack's had the same hairstyle. He seems to be cleaned up a little bit. A lot more cleaned you know what up. I mean? Like it, like so. Is this a? It's a different time. So here's my thing. It, I I think there's a couple of different ways you can look at this ending. Uh, uh-huh. I I've always took it as. Jack is now a part of the hotel and that he wasn't in that picture originally. And now that he's dead, he is in that he's trapped in the overlook. I could also see it as Jack Torrance that we see in this movie is a reincarnation of himself from an earlier time. And he's just in this endless cycle, you know, of like a, yeah, like a limbo. Yeah. Thing, like that's, a, I mean, there, there's, you can see it either way. I've always took it as the former, but I, I, I don't come down hard on one it's, side or the other. Yeah, and I think, and it's ambiguous intentionally. Like it's it's not yeah, definitive. Yeah, I think a lot of this it, it's meant to be uh, use your imagination. It's up to your interpretation of what what it is. Yeah. Uh, personally, I think I don't know. This is also something I picked up on the watch. Jack mentions uh, how it's weird when you first got here. He. He mentioned something. I can't remember the oh, exact says, dialogue. He, he says, it, how, I feel like I knew what was going to be around every corner. Like exactly. he'd always so been it there. seems like he's been here, right? Yeah. And then as under the influence of the ghost or whatever, the hotel, whatever, it gets a little crazier. So at this point, you think he's just talking mad, like crazy shit, right? Yeah. But when he sets Danny down, he's like, I love this place. I wish we can live here forever and ever. Yep. And then when Wendy wants to leave, he's he is insulted yeah like he's like absolutely well, he too far gone yeah yeah and so that's like has he been here before 
uh, you got that vibe, and then the picture did everything but confirm that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just kind of seemed like, uh, yeah, exactly. I think it's just supposed to be cut and dry. Leave it to what you want it to be. Gotcha. Uh, I actually, actually talked to my mom about this, and she took it as exactly what you said. People that die at the hotel itself is haunted. It's not just a Jack thing, because what about the Grady family? What made him kill his family? Yeah. Type thing. If it was just Jack, then we would they that wouldn't that plot wouldn't be there. Yeah. My mom thinks it's uh it's the hotel is cursed, haunted, whatever. The manager did say people think it was built on a burial ground Native or American, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and so she thinks the hotel itself is haunted. And the picture, the nineteen twenty one Fourth of July thing, is just people that's been killed there. Yeah. But I was like, I didn't see the little girls. And she was like, well, it was an adult party. Maybe they weren't. I was yeah. like, eh, I guess. I mean, Dr. Sleep gets into it a little bit more as to what exactly is happening there. But I, again, I don't want to spoil it too much. Um, before we get to Silver Linings and stuff like that, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about two more things. Um, and, and I know there's so much we didn't get to. But like I said, we could be here forever. Uh, maybe we'll have to do a part two at some point. But um, the scene – where we see the all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. That whole scene right. is so fucking incredible because it manages to make me terrified and make me laugh hysterical at the same time. And <laughs> yeah. th- the part that I laugh at, it's not supposed to be funny, but you know, Jack's like, you think uh, you're concerned for Danny's health. And when he's like, yes, you think we should take him to a hospital? Yes. And just when do you think we should take him to a hospital? And she says, as soon as possible. And the way he mocks her back with, as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's not supposed to be funny, but man, it gets uh, me every time. It's so childish. <laughs> it's so, so petty. It's, but yeah, the part I was going to say that that scene that grows on me more and more every time is, you know, it's obviously Jack Nicholson's giving a great performance. Shelley Duvall in that scene is out fucking standing. And the part that really sticks out to me is when she says, I just want to go back to my room. Why? <laughs> I'm very confused. I just need a chance to think things over. It it's so I felt crushing that because she at, she came down here saying we need to take our son to a doctor yeah and she is so terrified and so broke down that she just wants to go back to her room like like well, she wants to obey like I'll leave you alone I'm I'm sorry yeah. like uh, I mean that's where you can get into yeah. the whole like this movie's about abusive relationships or toxic yeah, masculinity or whatever controlling or yeah. Stockholm syndrome whatever you want to call it but like. The fucking audacity of anyone that says the character of Wendy is stupid or pathetic. It's this woman has been in an abusive relationship that's clearly been occurring well before the hotel. And Duvall has to do this thing where she's praying she's playing a victim of emotional and verbal abuse, but maybe even physical abuse, we don't know. And she also but she's has still this a mother. Yeah, she she's trying her best to keep this family together, but she also has like this Subtle hint of like a naivety, like she's almost like a gullible aunt at some times. Like you know, like maybe not your mom necessarily, but someone in your family. Oh my god, yes. Uh, And I actually have a note on that. Uh, (laughs) I did look. There's one scene in this movie. I'm like, you're so fucking stupid. And it's right there at the beginning when Danny passes out brushing his teeth. Right. Yeah. Okay. This doctor. I don't know. There's no dialogue on them saying like oh yeah she's been our, this lady's been our doctor for years but yeah she just sits at the boy, table boy do you remember when daughters like, made house calls holy shit right what, <laughs> what's up with that yeah but she just sits down like this kid passed out brushing his teeth yeah the, Jack's not even there but she feels the need to sit down and have a cigarette with her at the kitchen table and tell her how Jack had a drinking problem and ripped her son ripped his son's uh, arm out of socket to a doctor that as far as we know, she just met. Yeah. Now, taking that back, Dustin, if I can change anything about this movie, it would be that scene. Not the passing out from brushing teeth, but just that I, me as an audience, I didn't want to know about the whole uh, incident with the alcohol in the shoulder. I, I felt like it would have hit harder because just knowing that, you know, when 
when they reacted saying you did this when he obviously didn't talk about the marks on his face and stuff. Yeah. And then cut. And then at the bar scene with Lloyd and he goes on that monologue and that's as the audience, we find out that, yo, he had a drinking problem and he hurt Danny really bad. Yeah. That's why that. she accused him. I just felt like that it would have just hit way no, harder because that scene I kind of agree with you. So much. Um, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. The only thing that I would keep in the, the only reason why I would say you do keep that doctor scene is it plays up more into the nonsensical timeline in this movie. And what I, what I mean by that is she says when she's talking to the doctor, this happened like five months ago. You know when Dan when he ripped Danny. Well, no, it happened. It happened three years ago, but he hasn't been drinking. Well, no, she he says drinking. It. She says it happened five months ago, and he stopped drinking then. He says it happened three years ago. Oh. So there's, a, oh, I mean, it, okay. it plays into more of this. You know, you don't know the full story, and you there's they do that with like. The subliminal stuff, like we like we talked about, with like rooms that architecturally don't make sense and like timelines right. and stuff like that's why I say you kind of keep it in, just because like it it really plays into the mystery of everything. Like you know, you're you're almost like a voyeur in the hotel watching all this happen. You're not getting the full story. But that being said, I do see where you're coming from. That it would have made more sense and hit harder for um for Jack to tell that part. But I also like that you get both sides of that story. That's what she saw. And that's what he saw. Yeah. She saw it as that was the day my husband like realized he had a drinking problem and he got better. Jack sees it as that was like the downfall of our relationship. You know? Yeah. Also it's going playing back on the, uh, like you, we talked about the American dream type thing. And if listeners out there, you've been in arguments with your boyfriend, girlfriend, it's always a he said, she said, yep. all this stuff. Uh, she sees it. Basically, there's things that she, like she'll like when Jack says she'll never let me forget it. Yeah. She's going to bring up something that happened years ago. Yep. Yeah, it was something pretty fucking serious, but okay. You know, yep. it happened. We moved on. Uh, it just kind of plays on that, t- like that they're not okay. You know what I mean? They're not okay. It's the like I said, it's the American dream relationship thing, just completely upside down yep. and the worst it could possibly be. Yeah. Um. Well, real quick, the last one thing I want to talk about um, before we get into the the silver linings and all that is we mentioned it before, but uh, the deleted ending of this movie. So this movie had a different ending when it went to theaters. Um, it's pretty lackluster. I mean, it's nothing. It's nothing that. You know, crazy, but I do see why they removed it. Um, you know, af- after its premiere, you know, the, the movie's in theaters for about a week into its theatrical run. Kubrick decides he wants to cut uh, the end of the movie. So he has to take these reels back, cut it, and put it back into theaters, which is kind of crazy. Um, but basically, the scene is just like, it shows Wendy and Doc at the hospital having escaped. And uh, Ullman shows up and says they couldn't find Jack's body. Um, but then he also gives Danny the yellow tennis ball that Jack was using um, at the hotel, like bouncing it around and stuff, and gives it to Danny. Um, right. So, I, I mean, like I said, I get why it was cut out. It's you don't really need that. It's the way they play it is much better with the ambiguous photo on the wall than oh, nobody was ever found. Like that's almost like a campfire story way of yeah. ending your movie. Like ooh. Yeah, exactly. He might as well hold a flashlight yeah. up to his face and go, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen a print of it. I've seen f- still photos of it, but I've never seen the actual scene. I've seen still photos. Yeah. But honestly, I don't I think that gives us too much. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I mean even even when you look at a broad spectrum, like that's not giving us anything at all. It's it's not giving you film. anything you need. Like we don't need to know that that Jack's body, quote unquote, was never found, and you know it. It's much scarier to you get. It's it's weird. It's a movie where you watch the villain die, and yet it's still scary. Yeah, you're still terrified. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, and it. Yeah, let's talk about uh, some one other piece of trivia I wanted to talk about that um, I don't, I don't know if you got this in your research too, but I didn't know about this until this uh, oh, research for this. Too. Um, the all work and no play 
uh, the pages. We, 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 I think most people that know anything about this movie know that that was all real typed out pages. Like it wasn't just Xerox because you can see like – Yeah, it had different formats and different – Typos uh, and stuff like that. Typos yeah. and stuff. But for the yeah. international versions of this film – Yep. There were different yep. languages translated. Different languages. So well, – Yeah, translated it was uh, German, Italy, and – I have the German, the French, the Spanish, and the Italian right here. Um, okay, read them out. The German one translated to never put off till tomorrow what may be done today, which I feel like is a pretty good one. It kind of falls in line with the same uh, theme that All Work and No Play does. Um, the French, yeah, and it, the writer's block stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, the French version is kind of weird. It's one, here you go, is worth more than two, you'll have it. I don't get it. I don't get it. With, apparently, that's, that's a French – uh, phrase that's kind of similar to uh, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Yeah. The Spanish version was no, ma- no matter how early you get up, you can't make the sun rise any sooner, which is also kind of eerie. Like, I like that one. Yeah. But by far the strangest one is the one that was Italian, which is the morning has gold in its mouth. <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to translate to, like, in terms of, like, an idiom, but... Very strange. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, that's uh, that's uh, the trivia I had. Yeah. Before I forget this, uh, not that scene, uh-huh. but the um, the scene, the interaction before, where he's finally started typing. She comes in, talking about going for a walk or something like that. Yeah. And he's somehow getting distracted. Jack Nicholson actually wrote that scene. Oh, that's great. I yeah, mean, it's a great he scene. Wrote that he uh, basically at the time, of course, he was acting, but he was also doing a lot of writing, and he related so much to finally being on track, and then you know just being that exhausted and finally getting there, but you can't stop because you're finally in the groove, yeah, and you just lash out. And I, he, I can yeah. attest to that. Like, not that I've ever like physically or verbally like lashed out like that, but you do feel like, especially screenwriting, like you get when you're in that groove and you're going and you're going and someone breaks your concentration or like, you know, you have to stop to do something. It is gut. Like it, it yeah. physically is painful. <laughs> like it, it really yeah, hurts. It's it's so, it's so bad. Like I'll be in mid sentence or something like that though. If someone talks about something that wasn't related to what I was saying. It's all gone. I yeah. have no idea what I was saying. <laughs> and you've heard it in this podcast. Actually guys, that's, <laughs> that's JT is just seething the whole that. time. <laughs> Yeah, like like Danny trying to talk to Doug in my name. <laughs> uh, well, one last thing before we get to Silver Linings. Uh, we have to do this because this movie's got so many different options. We got to talk about Prop Cop. Oh, God. Yeah, we do. So I have so many things I want from this movie. So many things. It's hard for me to pick one. But i tell you what. I'm going to let you go first because I want you to take whatever you take. I want you to take it off the table for me. So I don't have that as an option. Okay. So this is going to sound weird. Okay. It might not be the ideal prop cop in the movie or Danny's wearing this Mickey Mouse sweater thing and it's a uh, football one. Yeah. Fucking. Oh, man. Yep. Uh, His sweater game is awesome in this movie. I can't remember if it was me or my brother. The color. It was different color. I mean, it was it was kind of. There's only two colors on that sweater. I'd, uh, it was different color than yeah. that, but we actually had that sweater. I just oh, that's awesome. Really remember. It was either, Dude, I miss those the, like custom-knit sweaters. I had a Ninja Turtles one when I was a kid. Bro, that was awesome. I remember. I, th- I think Shay still has your like second-grade picture where you had that your foot propped up and your sweater game yeah. is on point. Those Ninja Turtle Jordans, yeah, as man, I like to call like, them. Sweater... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus! No. So you want the sweater? That's Dude, awesome. I would love to have the sweater again. So, so we talked about one of the things I wanted. I wanted the Dick Halloran paintings in his bedroom, oh, yeah. but that's not what I'm going to pick for the episode because I went through so many different things. I wanted that. I wanted the maze model on the table that Jack looks at because I just think that's awesome. Or the, there's you so know, many the, play, the tennis ball, the tennis ball, the play girl that Jack's reading, Wendy's baseball bat. There's so many good things, that, but uh, I ultimately, well, I ultimately had to come down on the, 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 that, that's it. Like the thing of this movie. And that is the ax. Yeah. Jack's ax. It's, 
I love that they played homage to it too in like Breaking Bad. They had the same well, a similar axe to that. Yeah. It's it's that's for some reason you don't see a lot of silver like plated yeah. axes. You know what I mean? It's, and it's red so for fire and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. And it's weird too cuz in the movie you get close-ups of it kind of when he's chopping through the door. It's not that sharp. No. Like it, it's it's well, but it's I such think a that's good that's also with uh, again with Jack going through 60 doors. They were like, "Yo, file this thing <laughs> down." Very good point. Can we but yeah, I ultimately came down on the axe. It's it's just you got to take it, man. Yeah, okay, you got to take it. Another, I don't know. You think about it, and like, I don't know. There's not much else that just stands out except for the items we just listed. Nothing that would just. I mean, there, I could think of a lot of stuff. Honestly, the, the glass that he drinks the whiskey out of is great. I thought about the, just the snow cat. I just want a snow cat. One the whole snow cat. Just the whole one. yeah. <laughs> Hello again, it's me. Real quick, Dustin Goes Hollywood. Just want to let you know that's the end of part one uh, of our discussion on The Shining. If you want to hear part two, stay tuned. It'll be dropping soon in your feed sometime this week. Uh, We really hope you enjoyed part one, and uh, we hope to see you again in part two. Excelsior! 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 Look it up!